Right, folks, this is a new podcast from the two mics, and I'm going to give you old energy boy, MG, to introduce it. Yeah, we've edited out all the nonsense with Mike Porky Perry, so it might be a bit shorter than usual. Ha, 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 ha. Champagne all round, mm. and put it on my tab. I'm Mike Graham, he's Mike Parry, you're listening to the Two Mics on Talk Sport. It's a night of mourning on Merseyside after the City's two football teams were humiliated at the hands of North London rivals Arsenal and Spurs. For Everton, the 5-2 defeat saw them drop into the bottom three, with Ronald Koeman seemingly clueless about what to do next. For Jurgen Klopp, another defensive disaster leaves Liverpool in ninth place, 12 points off Manchester City. How much longer will the fans put up with it? And why should they? 08717 223344. Later on in the show, we'll be offering counselling for the Porkmeister, and we'll be drawing inspiration from a passage in the Bible for him. We'll also be going down under to catch up with our favourite Australian, Sandra Lee, to see if she can cheer him up. And we'll be finding out why the gunpowder show had to be so bloody and brutal last night. You're listening to The Two Mics with me, Mike Graham, and Mike Parry. On top... This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. If you are up on Merseyside tonight, we do want to hear from you because it's been a pretty miserable day all round. It's time to say on this sad occasion a very good morning. Sorry, good evening, I should say, to so Mr. Mike, a porky parry. Mr. Parry, I was going to give you a hard time, but I feel no. sorry for you now. Well, I feel bad for you. I actually feel genuine yeah. hurt mm. and, uh, mm. and sort of, you know, on your behalf, humiliation. Yeah, well, don't feel sorry for me. Don't feel humiliation on my behalf. I'm sorry. I've been an Evertonian all my life. Um, you have bad seasons, you have good seasons, mm. you have form, which is temporary. Class is permanent. Everton are a class organisation, and we will get out of the uh, mess that we're in, um, you know, because we have to, because uh, that's what's going to happen. I, this must be one of your lowest points, though, mustn't it? It's a very low point, because we've uh, dropped down now into the uh, bottom three, which is shocking for a club like Everton, and considering all the investment that was put into the club over the last 18 months and the spending spree over last summer... But that's where we are, and so we've got to do something about it. What I, what I found most um, unnerving about today was that Mr Cooman, at the end of the game, some would say bravely, stepped up in front of the camera. Yes. and was I, have to say, I have to say that he stood up for himself well. Yep. I mean, you know, he didn't appear to have much to say because there's not much he could say. No. But, I mean, at least he did it. Yeah, yes, but I'm sorry... I, what I'm saying is he didn't look hurt and he didn't no. look shocked and he didn't look like he felt embarrassed about what had happened and he didn't look like he didn't know where, you know, his next goal was coming well, you from don't want his him next to, victory but you was coming you don't, from. You don't want him to look like a broken man, though, do you? I don't want to look like a broken man, but I, what I'm saying is the, the uh, performance he gave at the end of the game and not very long after the end of the game... I'm wondering whether that was a man in shock mm. rather than somebody who was analysing what, well, he, he what had just happened. He might be And if shock. he's in shock, has he got any answers? Because I don't think he's got any answers. I mean, no. you know, announcing today before the game, right, we're going for, you know, three at the back. Yeah. Well, what kind of system were you playing? I don't understand. Was no. the three at the back designed to make us more attacking with win backs or was it designed to make us more defensive? Was it designed so that we had more midfield players or that we had a five-man defence? I could not work Certainly out what we were doing. during the game, I was hearing a lot of criticism of the fact that Arsenal were being allowed to play too far up the field yep. and that if they were playing more yep. defensively, they were too far back yep. and they were letting Arsenal dominate the game. Sure. I have to say that uh, Wayne Rooney's goal was sublime. I absolutely well, loved it. I have to say, I when, I saw the, when I saw that goal going in, <laughs> Yeah. Although it was very much against the run of play, yeah. Yeah. you thought, well, maybe, maybe, Paul, because you had unfortunately tweeted out once again that you mm. have to believe, because you do have to believe. Yeah. You're an Everton fan. You yeah. have to believe yeah. that this is going to be the game that kickstarts the season. Yes. It's a shame that you've been writing that now for every game since about two or three weeks ago. Yeah. But, I mean, here we are. Yes. And so when I saw that goal go in, I thought, well, maybe this week, Porky will get it right. Maybe. And maybe this will kickstart the season. Maybe. But, but I'm it, afraid it didn't. It wasn't to be. So we're in crisis now. So, of course, the next question is, what do you do now? Yeah. Well, that is the decision for the people who own the club. Well, Bill Kenwright didn't look like a very happy man, I have well, to say. Well, Mr Kenwright wears his heart on his sleeve with Everton yeah. because it is not just part of his life. It, yeah. is, it is almost totally his, I mean, but the his other whole guy, life Mishiri, with his family and, 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 and his business. Of... But, I mean, it's, it, it, what I'm saying is every... Every pore of his skin oozes blue Evertonian yeah. blood. You know? Well, Mashiri, who's, who's every pore of his skin for a long time, was with the other side of the, uh, the 
aisle with today. Arsenal. With Arsenal. Yeah. He was kind of waving around, shouting, sort of smiling at people, waving at the cameras and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't know quite what his commitment is. Well, I didn't say any of that. And was that before or after the game? It was during. During the game. Yeah, during okay, the game. Well, every that, time yeah. they panned on Bill Kenwright to say yeah. to show how sort of despairing he looked. Yep. There was a sort of wave coming from Mashiri and yeah. a sort of smile. You know? Yeah, sure. Um, odd, really. I saw a newspaper headline this morning saying uh, Moyes is back in town. Former yeah. boss Ray made return. Well, good God. Ever- Everton are too big a club to go backwards. I'm not, by the way, I'm not uh, criticising Davy Moyes. Davy Moyes did a fantastic job for Everton. Well, he did an okay for, job for 11 Everton. years. Yeah, but hang on. Well, well he didn't have any money. No, he I know. But money. my point is, is that, you know, since last year, you've been predicting that, uh, that Everton will be in the top four, yes. uh, that Coombe will be one of the top managers. Yes. You know, so you don't really want somebody like David Moyes, who has failed miserably since he left Everton to do anything well, other that's than. That's very unfair. Well, no, it's all he's done is fail. He went to Manchester United and he failed. He went to Spain, right? And he mm. failed. He went to mm. Sunderland and he failed. I'm yeah. sorry, though. Even Scotland don't want him. Yeah. So why would Everton want him? Uh, an old colleague of mine wrote a piece today in a Sunday newspaper, a guy called Joe Bernstein, right? Uh-huh. Old colleague used to work here, actually, oh, yes. at um, Talk Sport. And he obviously um, has his ear to the ground mm. because he says that uh, when uh, Mr. Cooman was at Southampton, even though they finished sixth, yeah. a lot of agents were ringing up other clubs trying to move their players out of Southampton right. at the end of that season yeah. to get them somewhere else. Right, what, because they wanted more money? No, they would even have gone for less money, apparently, right. because Mr. Cooman's authoritarian regime yeah. did not resonate nicely with players, OK? Well, you say that, but, I mean, we talked about this on Friday night, because yeah. on Thursday night, you know, mm. that disgraceful behaviour by some of the Everton players, Ashley Williams being the yep. leader of them, yep. um, that didn't look like a guy who was frightened of the ramifications from a you know, disciplinary I manager. Ashley, I think Ashley Williams is, is beyond that. But the point I was going to make is, is that as soon as Mr. Cooman left and went to Everton, yeah. all those agents who were trying to push the players out of Hampton mm. then said, no, we want to stay now they wanted to stay really? but it was it was small things like for instance after training in the canteen none of the players were allowed to go up and get their food before Cooman and the coaching staff arrived right. in the canteen okay. and had their food first. Oh, all right. that kind of stuff. Petty dictatorship stuff. So a bit like stuff. the 1984 style. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, petty stuff. Now, if that's the case, then... Some, some are more equal than others. You, yes, exactly. You can do that if you're winning and you're successful. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to be the big boss and Billy Big Boots and, uh, listen, son, remember who's in charge mm. around here, yeah. you've got to bring the bacon home. Yeah. And, and I tell you something, if he's doing that and... and does it not bring perhaps a bit more light onto things like, you know, why some of our players are not available to play at the moment mm. when they should be available to play? You know what I mean? Well, I mean, the Barkley situation exactly. still hasn't Ross ever Barkley. really been resolved. No. Nobody really knows no. why Barkley and Cumin fell out. Yeah. Nobody really understands I, how that happened. Yeah, I, you can come in and, and apparently he is a very cold man mm. and uh, he doesn't have any sort of, anything like a fatherly rela- relationship with the younger players, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Well, he, he said himself in the interview after the game today, yeah. um, you know, there are 25 uh, people, players in the squad, mm. you can't please all of them. Yeah. But I presume that was his way of explaining that not everybody likes him. Well, not everybody likes him and that uh, not all the players that he bought uh, over the summer are now playing, of course, because some of them have been hapless and hopeless you know, Clarson and people like that, they don't seem to be producing the sort of performances which we had hoped they would. Yeah. And also, again, I don't understand this three at the back, two wing. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what's going on. Look, I, I don't want to dwell on it, but I do want to talk to anybody out there who's got an answer to the conundrum. The conundrum being what's going on at Everton. The well, number, please, is mm. 08717. Double two, double three, double four. I would also like to extend that to Liverpool fans yeah. because, believe me, it, it didn't uh, in any way um, ease the pain I was suffering today that you got beaten uh, so heavily well, by Spurs Well, Jurgen Klopp is another manager, right, who seems yeah. to be under the impression that uh, he's incredibly good at his job and he doesn't quite understand why they keep letting in so many goals. Mm. I mean, that's the, that's the impression you get yeah, from it. Actually, you know, he sits there <laughs> as if he's got this fantastic... Like mystified. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Theory. I mean, I heard Dean Saunders talking for Talk Sport uh, yeah. watching the game, and he said, sure. "You know, the best thing Liverpool yeah. can do mm. is sell Coutinho and buy a new back four and a new goalkeeper." Which well, seems very sensible mm. to me. He said mm. it to us the other day mm. when we spoke to him. I think it was on, uh, yeah. uh, on a week ago Saturday. It was, yeah. And I mean, but Klopp mm. is sort of, you know, it's almost it's like a rabbit in the headlights. Where yes. He goes, "I can't understand uh, yeah. why we keep losing." Yeah. Well, the reason you keep losing <laughs> is because these goals keep going in yeah. uh, because you've got people like Dejan Lovren, yeah. uh, who's hopeless. Yes. Uh, you've got yeah. Mignolet, who's hopeless. That's right. You know, and I, you need I to mean, do, something. do you know what? I, uh, I think I've told this story before. About four or five years ago, I was up at Sunderland for Sunderland-Everton night game, and uh, it was Mignolet's last season yeah. at Sunderland before oh, yeah. he went to Liverpool. Mm. 
And I was in the director's box. I mean, everybody, you know, oh, it'll be a disaster when Mignolet goes. Oh, yeah. why? He's not only is he the best goalkeeper in the Premier League, he's probably one of the world's best goalkeepers. Well, he, he, he saved us 20 goals a year. To be fair, <laughs> I thought yeah. of Jason Pickford yesterday, yeah. uh, this, uh, this afternoon, I should say. I thought say. Pickford was I brilliant. Mean, it could have been about 11 3, yeah, 11 I t- 1. I tell you, Gray, I thought Pickford was brilliant. Mm. So, listen, this is a question I have to ask um, Everton fans. Where do we go from here? Yeah. In, f- in fact, look. If I were you, I'd go down to the, uh, to the, the Labour Exchange if there is such a thing in football and go and hire a whole new team. If I was... That's what I would do. If I was in charge of Everton, I would ask myself the question, what do I do with my manager tonight? We've slipped into the bottom three. Yeah. Do you say, well, I tell you what, we'll wait until we get to the January transfer window and then buy a striker, mm. which is what you desperately need. That could be Except good. for the fact that that is the major error that Mr Cooman has made because he's had since last Christmas to buy a striker and didn't. But haven't they? Didn't they so could we hire... trust him to spend any more of yeah. our money? Well, hang on. Didn't they bring the recruitment specialist from Leicester? To Everton. Yeah, right? Steve Walsh. Yeah, so what's happened to him? I don't know. Has because he... because he, he has to bear some responsibility for the players we purchased. The only player we bought who's actually given us a return yeah. is Wayne Rooney. Yeah. Without a shadow well, of a doubt. Well, at least he keeps scoring whatever few goals they score. The at goal least he, he scored today them. was sublime. I couldn't even see a goal there when he got it. And I yeah. thought, what's he going to do now? And mm. wacky. And, and, and he plays it so perfectly. That, that boy's terrific. That boy is an Everton hero through and through. Well, he is. But, I mean, he's not helping them enough. That's the problem. Well, How about well, hang this? on, hang on. He can't play for the other ten on the pitch or the other nine on the well, pitch as it came towards the end of the game. That may course. well be true. But, yeah. you, know, there's, you know, he's not the answer anyway. Damien says this. Breaking news, Porky. The Black Death has reached Goodison and Anfield. Yeah, well, After you told us about it in Madagascar, in Madagascar the other day. Yeah. It seems to have done yeah. that. We yeah. do want to hear from you, of course. We're going to talk uh, to our good friend, uh, Coming up very, very shortly, uh, up from uh, from yeah. the Daily Mail, Dom King, yeah. who's going to talk to us about the problems on Merseyside because Liverpool are a long way off the top now and, and Everton, of course, are in the bottom three. 08717 This is Talk Sport. The moment I spoke to the players and uh, everybody's so disappointed, uh, it's, it's how you look to this situation. If you start to think negative then maybe there is no solution don't talk about positives because the final result is 5-2 defeat at home and write what you like to write tomorrow it's defensive yeah it's defensive so the first one is uh, everybody is there in the corner apart from Roberto Fabinho Fabinho has to stay where he stays and um, they throw a ball and after the first touch they have another two with nobody from us is really there. Just really difficult to accept. I don't know whether this is the new form of management speak, you know. Mm. It's really difficult to accept. Yeah. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, and when, when uh, Ronald Koeman says, uh, write what you like, you know, what does that mean? Does well, that mean, you, well, you write what you like anyway. Yeah, well, it's it's not that. that. Write what you like means that you know I don't care. You know, you know. I, I mean, that's that's giving up. Write what you like means that you you can't hurt me. You can't. Hurt, and to me, that's an indication of a manager who's losing his grip. Yeah. Well, let's find out from Dominic King, who's at the game, whether he thinks Ronald Koeman is losing his grip, or indeed whether his grip should be loosened. Dominic, mm. a very good evening to you. Hi, Dom. Are you there, Dominic? Yes, yeah, yeah. Can Hi, you hear Dom. Me? Yeah, oh, we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Now, tell us, um, you were there. Um, Ronald Koeman said some strange things afterwards, but he, he fronted up and, uh, and sort of admitted that there were problems. But but where's it all going wrong? First of all, uh, the big question is, um, you know, what's going to happen to him? Um, well, I don't think there's going to be any decisions made um, in the next, you know, next couple of days or not. Um, I think I think he still. He's in a very, very difficult position. Um, I, I would say that, and that he, he needs to he needs to start winning um, because the, the, the one thing that I think um, is his biggest problem in all this is that he's. Um, I would say seventy five percent of the fans, maybe a bit more, of have, have lost faith with him, and mm. it, it's it's very, very hard to turn back um, a, a group of supporters when they're in that mindset, particularly given how. Um, they have been playing, and and the results they've had. Uh, there's just there's, there just doesn't seem to be any um, rhyme or reason to what, what 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 is going on since the start of the season. Well, well Dom, if you don't mind me interrupting, the rhyme and reason is he's got it completely wrong. He bought the wrong players. He didn't buy a, a centre forward. I couldn't understand the formation of the team today or how they're expected to play. And when you said uh, just now, nothing will happen in the next two or three days. Tactically, Everton have got to be seen to be doing something. Our next game is at Chelsea on Wednesday night. I shall be there. You probably will. 
we're probably going to get beaten because Chelsea are a very good team. Do you not want to get knocked out of that cup, though? I, I do not want to get knocked out of anything. The following uh, Sunday, we go to Leicester, who themselves, you know, are battling for their lives. I mean, what do we do? Just sit there and take one humiliation after another? No, I am... I, um... <laughs> I, I, I think I think you just mentioned the big. I think I think next week against Leicester um, is a huge game. I, I yeah. think I, I really. I mean, let's put put the cup to, cup to one side for a minute. Um, I, I mean, I, I that is obviously a competition to sort of that Everton should really be targeting. I've always thought that. Um, so do the, I. We should have won the, it. The league cup is all. Yeah, it, it's a huge. Huge trophy that, that I, I don't understand how Everton have never have never mm. won. Yeah. Let's just put this to one side because that's not going to sort of um, help the Premier League. I think that that game against Leicester next week, given the run they've been on, I think that is that is absolutely huge for mm. him. Um, and look what Leicester have done with their with their yeah. poor form. Hey, eh? well, that's one of the questions I was going to ask you, Dom, as well, because a lot of people are asking about Steve Walsh. This is the recruitment sort of genius who supposedly made Leicester the team that they were when they won the Premier League title. He's been, uh, you know, poached and, and moved to Everton. Well, what's he doing? Yeah, well, it, it, I mean, it, that's a it, it's a very valid question, and it, you know, I've, I've put something in um, the stuff that I've, I've written for tomorrow about that. I mean, mm. he he was, you know, he's they knew. From last, well, midway through last season, that Lukaku wasn't going to going to be here at, 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 um, mm. for this season. Everyone knew it. He went public with it in March, when he was, you know, he was he made an, an absolute um, emphatic um, case for the fact that he was going to be leaving. They yeah. should have known there and then that the absolute priority was to get a striker in. Exactly. Uh, Walsh and Koeman between them should have known. They've been backed by Mashiri and Ken Wright all the way through through this summer. Every target they wanted, they've got for them. Uh, they, they, they provided the funds for. Um, but the striker was the one thing that, they, that everybody knew that they needed and they didn't do it. So that has to come down to between the manager and, and the director of football. Mm. They, they thought they had Giroud. Now... <sighs> Did he get led down the garden path by Giroud? I don't know. But um, Kuman was of the opinion that he, that he thought he had him. It never came off. There should have been something else to, you know, to at least get them through. Because mm. um, as, as well as Calvert Lewin has done, he's he's not a finished article by any means. No, he's not. He's a good so, young lad. I mean, the thing is, Dom. If they're experienced in football matters, to say, oh, we had our had the wool pulled over our eyes by Olivier Giroud. Footballers are mercenary creatures. They don't sign until they've exhausted every other option. Yeah, and they should and have known that. No, the one thing he kept saying at the end of last season when he was he was very critical about um, Ross Barkley was he kept saying, "I need I need more productivity from um, from from the team. I need more goals around the team." Uh, well, so far this season, they've played nine games and only two players have scored in the Premier League. Yeah, Nyash, Unbe- Nyash, unbelievable. Really. And without Rooney, we wouldn't be there. Let's move on to Liverpool, Don, please, because although you weren't at that game today, is there a crisis now um, building at Anfield? Well, they're not in the bottom three, to be fair. No. Well, they're not, yeah. but, but they had ambitions at the start of the season to challenge for the Premier League title. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think um, this defeat, I mean, look, looking at the... Looking at the reaction from fans and reading his uh, his comments, um, which are also bizarre in their own way, where he talks about you know how disappointing it all is, as if it's nothing to do with him. Well, there is something to do with him because uh, he hasn't he hasn't addressed the shortcomings of the defence that, right. that, that that have been there for two years. Right. Mm. Well, again, listening to the talk sport commentary today, and Dean Saul is talking about you know the fact that you know the well, back I four. I listened to it on the way home, gents. Yeah. He, he was he was very very entertaining. Well, he team, was. Yeah. But the back four, he says, have never played together. He says you can't play together as a back four unless you know what you're doing. You know, the, you practice on the training ground. You move at the same pace as each other so that you're not leaving any gaps. You know, you know where everybody is. None of the Liverpool back four know. No, any of that stuff. No, but it's it's. It, uh, I know the back four gets um, the back four gets a torrid time, and and rightly so with some of the mistakes that they made. But uh, there's a couple of goals early, that, that they conceded early in the season that had nothing to do with the back four. And there was one against Seville where basically it came from a throw in, and they ran straight through. The, it was the, it was the equalising goal in the two two, and it was a throw in, and there was a touch forward and another touch forward, and they went they went right through the middle of the park. Right. Mm. Well, I think he, that, refer- he referenced that, that today, didn't he? Yeah, that's not just about that, that's not just about four defenders. That's that's the team as a whole. Yeah, mm. that that's something that the, you know they've got to. I, I mean, I don't know what they're doing in, in, in terms of um, 
it, 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 it would sound like broken records, keeping going on about it. And yeah, you do. Like, I mean, it, sorry, you not you do, but the whole the whole situation is a broken record on Merseyside. Yeah. You know, uh, and 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 my colleague here, MG, is right. The the two managers concerned almost look as though they've been smacked on the back of the head with a pan and don't realise that they're in crisis. Maybe mode. that would be the pl- that would be a plan. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a few people who'd like to do some smacking yeah. down the heads with fans tonight, given that how... Yeah, uh, yeah they're, trying to, they're trying to move are. away from that sort of thing at Goodison, to be honest, uh, Don, but, but that's another <laughs> yeah. story. It's a bit but, harsh. But, yeah. I mean, let's, let's, let's face it, we haven't got a lot of time here. By the time Christmas comes around, surely Ronald Koeman is the more likely of the two managers to be out of a job, isn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, I'm, I don't think Klopp's going anywhere. I mean, you, the one thing you need to, to think about Klopp is, is, is this. He's, he spent £60 million on a... Um, a midfielder mm. in Naby Keita, who he hasn't had the chance to work with yet. He's mm. not going. He's not going anywhere, and the board and the owners are, are not going to no. do anything with him. Yeah. Um, Koeman, uh, and well, as, as we said at the, the top of the, the top of the call, it's it's, it's getting it's getting getting hot. It's, it's, Dom, what is your very, very hot. what is your understanding about the relationship between Mr. Koeman and the players? And does the Ross Barkley situation now take on a different light? In uh, this, go on. Go, yeah, that's a good question, Mike. Um, what I, w- I think it, it's it's important to point out is this isn't like it was towards the end of um, Roberto Martinez's time, where you could you could see the chasm between the manager and the players, and it was you know there was clearly problems with the dressing room and him. Mm. Um, I know that the, there are still players that have got huge amounts of respect for Coombe and, and wanted to work for him. I don't think you know I don't mm. think there's any sort of case of um, people throwing in the towel or. or or that yeah. it, it certainly hasn't got to that stage yet, but I, I just don't think he's 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 got what what Evertonians want yet, and and I don't think there's a sort of connection between the manager and the and and the fans, and it, yeah. it's not been there. It, well, it hasn't been there all season. No, no. Was well, it there? Has it been there since David Moyes left? I would ask you, Dominic. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they loved Martinez in that first season. Yeah, they, they did. They, 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 they really did. Um, I remember him posing with the pictures at the Christmas party with all the blue hats on and all that. You, you said know, you could yeah. never trust a man of all tan shoes. Uh, well, you know, that, that, would, that, that was proven to be right in the end. But what I'm saying is, he's a bit aloof, isn't he, Mr Coombe? And he thinks yeah. a lot of himself. Yeah, he, he is aloof. And um, I, I think, you know, I, I just don't think he's... I don't think he understands what, what, what. I don't know whether he understands the size of the size of Everton. I don't think he's yeah. he fully appreciates the history and, and, and the, you know the favour of the fan base and, and what we expect of him. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. you know, with the greatest respect to Southampton, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying anything disparaging about it, but life on the south coast and 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 the scrutiny they get you get in the press is is a world away from what what, what he's come up to here. Yeah, and sure, yeah. I think maybe. Uh, Look, he's played for Barcelona. He's been in Holland. He's the, he's the top man in Holland. Of course he is. Yeah. He knows. But it, it, I, may, uh, I think another way of saying this: I think his eyes have been open to to the realities of, yeah, of, of reality of, of yeah. the realities of of demanding well, excellence. That could be another uh, way yeah. of saying he's not up to the job. Uh, is he yeah, up to the be. job? Yeah, uh, maybe he's be. not up to the job. Dominic, thanks very much indeed. Ooh. Dominic King there from the Daily Mail, uh, Merseyside correspondent. We want to hear from you. Oh eight seven one seven double two double three. Double four. Uh, PT says if Cumin was banished to Siberia as a manager team and he was still hopeless, he could then send him down a salt mine. Says Paul. Uh, Sorry, um, what does that mean? Well, I think he's making reference, nonsense. making reference to your salt mine yeah. conversation from the other day. Yeah. And Blaze says, I feel a bit sorry for Everton's goalkeeper, Jordan Pickford. Back-to-back relegations is not really what you want on your CV. And by the way, he's our best player today. Oh, well, he was. Of a doubt, you know. But if they go down, he's yeah. not going to be too happy, is he? Well, he won't stay. Uh, well, uh, play like. Have you accepted that they might go down? No, of course not. No? Of course we're not going down. Are Don't you sure? Ridiculous. Absolutely Hang certain. on, everything else you've said that's going to happen hasn't happened. No, absolutely certain. We're really? going to finish mid-table with really? a, a rally, you know, when somebody gets it right and mm. gets us there. Okay. The resources of Everton are now good, far too good. Mind you, having said that, I've spoken to people in Newcastle a number of times who yeah. said they thought they'd never go down. Yeah, exactly. Ever. They've been down twice. Yeah, that's the trouble. 08717 with the two mic.
This is Talk Sport. We are of the two mics. We'll take your calls later on. 087172233344. Lots and lots of tweets coming in as well, uh, which I shall read to you as they come. Mm. Uh, Mr. Perry can tweet us, of course, at the two mics, at Mike Perry, yeah. at I R O M G. Yeah. But uh, we're going to be um, uh, taking a little break throughout part of the show as well, because we don't want to turn it into a sort of uh, you know morning period for every no, single fans of Liverpool fans, as much as we want to uh, hear from you if you want to talk to us. Mm. But I mean, I'll tell you what I want to talk to you about. Yeah. We're getting a guest on it later on, okay. Rebecca Ryan. Idol, who's oh, a historian yes. and a, a filmmaker, oh, yes. because there was a show on last night which is right up your street, and I want to ask you what you thought of it. It's called Gunpowder. Oh, Gunpowder. I, yeah. I, I, I've, uh, I'm not going to tell you about that in case people haven't seen it. Mm. What do you mean you're not going to tell me about it? I'm not going to tell you about it in case people haven't seen it. Well, it was know, on you, last night. But, uh, I know that, but there's a well, Porky we, Vision coming up later this week. Well, okay. yeah, but we're going to be talking about it later on tonight. Oh, are we? Yeah, because oh, Rebecca's okay. coming on the show. Oh, Rebecca's coming on the yeah, show. Yeah, okay, because she's yeah. got a great what interest did you in the Gunpowder What did you think of it? Well, it made me feel sick, actually. Sick? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm I've watched many violent movies, right? Yeah. I'm not a fan of horror films, yeah. particularly. I don't no, like to I'm, watch... I'm not really. And, yeah, but you like to watch people being tortured, So, which is what I'm saying. It's right up your street. Oh, I'm not sure about that. I'm no, sure listen, I was having yeah. having something to eat yes. and watching it. It was on just after nine o'clock. Was it that and, uh, exotic meal you put together with a bit of garlic and all that was, kind of yeah, stuff? It was, yeah. It wasn't that exotic. It was some lentils yeah. and uh, garlic and yes. tomatoes. It was yes. very good. Right. Um, but the bottom line is, is that they, they unnecessarily... Mm. It's had an awful lot of criticism from people mm. because people are saying they're trying to turn it into Game of Thrones. Mm. Well, they've got this guy being hanged, drawn and quartered. Well, that's what you used to do in those days. Yeah, I know, but I don't Mm. want to see it happening. Well... They were literally pulling the entrails out of this guy oh, while he was it's still not alive. Nice. Did yeah, they? But, but did they, they were they showing then, you his face that he was still alive. But they, you know, what they then do. They then put them in a pan and they fry them in front of him. Well, what he did was you could see the. He would occasionally yeah. go to the crowd. Yeah. Then you would sort of see this blood splattering everywhere. Yeah. Well, it was and he was chopping brutal. the guy's uh, guy's sort of limbs off. Yeah. And he chopped his head off. Yeah. And then he puts the head in the tar bucket. Yes. And then holds it up. Yes. So that it's kind of dripping with tar. Yeah. It was just disgusting. It was way too over the top for me for well, a, for a, a you know sort of family show. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? It's not I, the kind of thing that we would encourage. Well, you know. Well, uh, let me tell you that. Uh, of course, I'll be doing Porky Vision later in the week. Yeah. But uh, I um, am also we're doing watching, a couple of shows on Talk Radio later in the we're week. We're doing a couple of shows on Talk Radio Thursday and Friday. Yeah. And on Friday, it's a bumper day yeah. uh, for anybody who likes listening to us. Yeah. Because Friday night, we do Some people show do. Here. A lot of people don't like no, listening another to us. Another show on Talk people Sport. people do like listening yeah. to us, yeah. But anyway, what I was going to say to you was, yeah. uh, is that I'm watching something called The Last Post. Oh, yeah. Now, this is about... Oh, I've seen a bit of that. ...about Aiden. Yeah, okay. I got a bit bored with that one, actually. Well, let me tell you... There's I, a lot of horizontal refreshment going on in that. Well, a lot of hor- horizontal refreshment, because when these soldiers are in this camp, you know, mm. in Aiden, which yeah. is God-forsaken place well, in the Middle East... Well, it's now the Yemen, isn't it? It's the Yemen now, yeah. It's it's on the like the spur of Arabia, if you see what I mean. You know spur what I mean? Spur of Arabia. The spur of Arabia. Right. Yeah. Is but, that like Lawrence of Arabia? Uh, well, it's where Lawrence used to gallop around Pam, on his camel. Yeah. Pam Spur of Arabia. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but let me tell she's you, she's on talk radio as well. Who? It's Pam Spur. Pam Spur. Yeah, she? she's a relationships expert and sexual uh, counselor. Oh, I don't know about sexuality counselor. Anyway, it's what happens Pam Spur. So all these soldiers are getting this sort of this camp, you know, and uh, and. A lot of the uh, soldiers' wives are receiving horizontal refreshment favours from uh-huh. other soldiers who don't happen to be their husbands. Are they always receiving them, or are they sometimes giving them? Well, giving and receiving, okay. you see, sort of thing. Because soldiers yeah. go off, like, for three days on, you know, a march across a bit of the desert. I watched it, and the like, guy got uh, blown carry, up. Carry on, um, hey? you know... Uh, Carrying up the Khyber. No, no, that was in uh, Pakistan. No, what was it? Carry on... Uh, well, I didn't know they did one in um, uh, Aden. No, well, they did one in the, in the Sahara, and it was based on the, um, you know, the French Foreign Legion. Oh, yeah. So it was carry on French Foreign Legion yeah. or something like that. Carry on but, in French. But anyway, so, so yeah, but what happens is, so you think, oh, this is a bit sort of iffy, you know. But then what happens is, mm. uh, it got gruesome mm. because the... Well, it's a serious show, isn't it? It's a serious show. I mean, it's not comedy. So these guys are all in the military police, OK? Yeah. And I can't work out what the military police do. I, I don't, I'm not sure if they're policemen or soldiers. Well, but no, I think they're, they're both. No, they're policemen in the military, that's, yeah, that's as right. the name would suggest. Yeah, but they fight. They're fighting soldiers as well. Well, not they, always. No, they are. No, they are. According to this, well, funny enough. Yeah. My, you know, long-standing first girlfriend Trudy, her oh, yeah. father was a sergeant major in the Royal Military Police. Oh, is that right? And wore a blue, uh, no, a red. He wore a red cap. They're called the red cap. They're called the red cap. Well, if you remember in Iraq, a very austere figure. If you remember in Iraq, there was that terrible incident where a load of red caps got cornered. Oh yeah, no, it's terrible. um, And and killed. Yeah, they did. It's shocking because they didn't have enough um, um, arms, bullets, and all that, and they didn't have enough support either. But uh, Trudy's father, uh, Bill, 
um, was... Was he know, always in uniform when you saw him then? Well, no, but I took her home too late one night and right. he got a bit angry. Did he? And uh, I yeah. thought, this is pull the... Pull a gun on you. Uh, well, not pull a gun on me, but, you know, the weight <laughs> of the British Army came down on my... Uh, the wrath of the British Dear Army God. came down on my shoulders. Yeah, shoulder. that's never good. But anyway, so, uh, mm. so what happens is... Uh, they suddenly have a mission where they have to go out in the desert and receive a prisoner, but the prisoner mm. is going to be captured because this guy is against colonial rule. Right. He's, an so he's a local, is he? He's a local guy, yeah. local guy, yeah. but very uh, unpleasant local guy. Yeah. And he's against colonial rule. OK. So, they, so they've targeted where he is, but then they're not good enough to go and get him. Mm. So guess what? The SAS arrive, right? Right, OK. And the SAS jump about 50 miles across this desert. uh uh-huh. To this building where they believe that the guy that have they, they come from Hereford then they've come all the way from Hereford really? yeah yeah right. and, and and but they've come uh, by boat because that a heli- takes a while doesn't it it does uh, a helicopter <laughs> a helicopter would be too loud to land them on the terrain oh, right. okay. they've got to sort of creep up all these because now they've got those silencer helicopters they, they certainly have yeah, yeah. so anyway uh, so the, how long is this story no hang on so the SAS are right gunpowder no yeah the S- well it's the same thing well it's the, not at all the same it thing. is if you listen the SAS arrived to go and get this guy and yeah. they find the building he's in mm. And they burst in and they got their guns and all that. He's not there. Right. So they come out in the courtyard and say, I wonder where he is. Right. And then they all got shot dead because what he's doing is he's in the field with all his mates. Right. But there's one guy who's not well, they're shot. They're not very smart, then, are they? They're not very, not very clever at all. No. But there's one guy who's not shot dead. He's taken prisoner. Right. The next thing you see, he is tied to a stake. Right. And Mr... Well, out in the hot sun. Out in the hot sun. Mm. Mr. Not-so-nice guy yeah. comes up and says... Uh, do you believe in your God? Uh-huh. He says, I do, yeah. OK. He says, Is he rushing, this guy? No, no, no. no. He <laughs> says, uh, you should start praying. So the soldiers start saying, mm. Our Father... Which art in heaven. Yeah. And this is by... The Lord's Prayer. Yeah, that's right. This is 1963. Yeah. Anyway, next thing we see, right, right. And this is horrific. Yes. Is the rescue mission moves in. Yeah. But when they get there, everybody's dead, except for the one guy... Right. ...who is not just dead, but his head has been put on a pole. OK, he's been beheaded. He's been beheaded yes. and his head's been stuck on a pole. Yeah, we didn't see it happening, though. Didn't see it happening. The problem with gunpowder is you saw it happening. But guess what was strange then? Guess what? what happened then? Well, I don't know. I didn't see Some it. Some other bloke from the SES who yeah. never made the end of the mission because he got blisters on his feet. I didn't think that SES people gave up when they got blisters. I no. thought I thought they kept walking until their feet had bled all its blood. Yeah, you know maybe. what I mean? Yeah. But he couldn't finish the mission because he had blisters. Yeah. So he then walks into the, the square where well, his the mate's same square. head is on the pole. Right. And guess what he does? I don't know. Takes his jacket off. Right. Goes to the pole. Yeah. Gets the head. Right. And then gets back in the jeep and takes it back to base. Well, so he takes the head back. Takes the head back. Well, I suppose that's and for then, human then, remains, isn't it? And, and then the strangest thing is... I don't know why you find this funny. Well, I'm not finding it funny. But <laughs> when he gets back, he says to somebody, it's almost like a joke. Have you seen one of these? <laughs> no, what he said was, he's in a state of shock because yeah. he's got his mate's head wrapped yeah, right. in his jacket. Yeah. And, and the officer says to him, are you all right? And he said, where's the mortuary? <laughs> I thought it was terribly funny that when he arrived at the mortuary and the mortuary attendant said... Only you find it as funny, right? <laughs> no, no. The mortuary you'd really, attendant you'd really said... you think gunpowder was a laugh a minute then. The mortuary attendant said, what are you doing here? <laughs> he said, well, I've, I've not got a body, I've only got a head. <laughs> Do you have one of those sliding things for a head only? <laughs> That's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> I can't believe you find it funny. <laughs> well, but the way, is, you, the way you tell them. Just terrible. Well, thank you very yeah. much indeed. Um, yeah. We'll be talking more about gunpowder a little bit later yeah. on. Uh, yeah. Paul will obviously think he's a comedy it's not show. It's not, it's not fair. It's a family yeah. show. This is Talk yeah. Sport. Yeah. Talk Sport, we are the two mites coming up a little bit later on. Uh, we're going to have heroes and villains, and of course, the Porky Sermon uh, will be here for people who need a little bit of spiritual guidance, and maybe people up on Merseyside who do. Mm. Craig actually says a show about people being tortured and ripped apart. Are you going to talk about Merseyside football all night? No. Yeah. Do you get the uh, do you get the join there? I, I, I do, yeah. Ivan says, carry on, follow that camel. 
Oh, is, that's uh, it. That was it. That was of. the one. Brilliant. See, I don't remember that one. I and, remember uh, we, did, I we you, did a Porky quiz on uh, Carry On Films once, didn't did we? Did we? Yeah. yeah. But I tell, uh, what's his name who was in that? You know, Captain so-and-so. Who? Phil Silvers. Oh, Phil yeah, Silvers. Yeah, Phil Captain Silvers. Bilko. Yeah, that's right. Was yeah. he? He was, I didn't yeah. Know he was in a, I didn't yeah, he know was. He was in Carry On Yeah, he was, yeah. yeah. Uh, Matthew says, I love how Porky always laughs when describing scenes of extreme violence and torture. Well, you know... It is I a bit unusual, that. I think you've got to ease the, you know, the distress that people might might feel when we're describing And also, it is, of course, a fictional situation that we're talking about. It's not if we're laughing at real no. uh, torture. No, exactly. Matt says, Porky did watch a very similar torture programme to UMG. It was called The Everton Game. Yeah, I'm afraid it was. Mm. Mm. Uh, Tim says, can we have another Porky Mark Hughes, uh, I mean, Fireman Sam impression, please? Uh, right, OK, yeah, no, I don't do those sort of things. Mm. Thank you. I respect the dignity of each individual. Oh, OK. Mm. Uh, lots more going on, of course, but uh, here's one from Alan. It says, yeah. calm down, uh, MG. Porky will be getting all excited over all that torture. You know what he's like. No, no, you don't know what I'm like, but, I mean, some of it does look, you know, rather ludicrous. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, well, mm. certainly last night, and we'll talk to Rebecca Rydell about this later on, yeah. but it's, I mean, just doing it for, for the sake of it. Yeah. I mean, like, you know yeah. how you sometimes watch, yeah. like, Versailles mm. was one of those shows where you thought, they're just throwing in a bit of Rogerisation here to make it sort of more appealing, and, and because then, it doesn't really add anything to the, to the show. And then as each episode went by, it was like um, woman on woman, and yeah. man on man, yeah. and then brother and sister, and yeah. it just got worse and worse. Yeah. yeah, I stopped watching it. Well, it, it just got ridiculous. Family and my show. fear is this is a three-part mm. series, this thing. It is, yeah. And they also had a scene where the woman uh, is taken... And she's quite an old woman, mm. but she's naked. Mm. And they lead her across the uh, the executioner's kind of platform. Right. And lie her on the ground. Yeah. Tie her arms up, right? Well, that's a bit hard. And then they put a, a door, oh, a heavy pr- door, oh, they press her, yeah. on top of her. Pressing. And some bloke puts a load of weights on her. Yeah, that's right. crush her to death. Yeah, but it's called pressing. Yeah, but that was before they cut the guy's head off. It uh, was horrible. Yeah, well, they, uh, I tell you what, there's a, there's a road in York called the Mumbles. Uh, oh, no, yeah. no, it's called the Shambles. In, Sorry, the Shambles. The Mumbles in Swansea. The Mumbles in Swansea. It's called yeah. the Shambles. That's where right. Catherine Zeta-Jones comes and, from. Yeah, that's right. It's called the Shambles, this road in York. That's where it's... you should live. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny, dude. Yeah. Yeah, that's very original. It'd be great right? for you. So it's called the, the Shambles. shambles. Mike <laughs> Perry, 29, the Shambles. It's, it's a Shambles, <laughs> and it's a road up to York Minster, right? I know it which well. Which is magnificent. I've been to the Railway Museum there. Yeah, OK. Which I'm is great. sure you have. Yeah. So anyway... Why would I lie about that? I don't know. I don't know. I'm but sure anyway, there's have. a museum in the Shambles, right. and, it, and it's got some history. Shambles of, Museum. You know, well, how York... Uh, uh, right, and, and in there, there's a picture of a door. No, there's a door. Yeah. And they say this door mm. was once used to uh, crush, you know, any somebody to right. death. OK. Because she was said to be a witch. Really? So what they do is, you're mm. absolutely right, they tell her to lie on the ground, yeah. then they put a door on top. They rip the door off the entrance to the house, yeah. put the door on top of it, mm. and then they go and invite people who are walking past <laughs> to, yeah, to come in and stand on the door. <laughs> I don't know why you find it so funny. Well, I don't know really, how ridiculous is that, you know. Well, this guy no. was putting, like, huge yeah. weights, yes. which were, like, you know, big blocks of metal. Yeah. And he had, like, four of them. Yeah, well, that's very and, unkind, that. And cause... he could barely lift them, but then he would lob one on, then yeah. lob another one on, Yeah. You know? It's very unkind because it obviously well, it certainly is unkind. well you can't breathe if there's too much weight on your chest. Well, you, like, you, you, it crushes all your bones. Yeah, of course it does. Your ribs can't go in and out. You can't breathe. So, mm. but it's uh, it's not a pleasant end, I have to say. It certainly isn't. No. Now, for those who are looking forward to a more unpleasant mm. or a less unpleasant end, mm. I should say, mm. uh, it's time for this. It is Sunday, of course, so uh, yep. for those who are in need of a bit of spiritual sort of uh, inspiration, Indeed. and uh, no fewer than uh, thousands of people, I suppose, who are mm-hmm. Liverpool and Everton fans might need some, yep. including you, yeah. uh, we have a porky sermon for you. Uh, this is where I will read a passage from the good book, Yes. Uh, in this case from Matthew 6, verses 25 to 27. Yep. Uh, I will then ask you to interpret it into modern day language. I will indeed. Okay, mm-hmm. here's what, what uh, Matthew has to say. Therefore, I tell Matthew, you. I know it well. Yeah. Matthew six. Yeah. Matthew six. Now. Yeah. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air; they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Mm. Yeah, very interesting. So I'm going to ask right. you to now okay. interpret that I'll for interpret us this into indeed, the well. modern uh, uh, parlance. OK. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink. Basically, that means that uh, if you're a believer, uh, you will always be provided for. Okay. Right. 
So there will always be uh, food and drink, yes. okay? Food and water. That's good to know. Or wine, um, or something to make you feel good, okay? Yeah, okay. So when it says, therefore, I tell you not worry about life, it means don't worry about the small things in life. Yeah. Now, what uh, what this um, is really doing is it is precipitating a financial crisis, oh, yeah. which used to happen in biblical times, yeah. when the moneylenders were cast out of the temple. Yeah. Uh, that um, that produced a financial crisis mm. because although Jesus said that you know money lending was wrong, wrong in the sense that you were making money from people who were uh, usury, yeah, yeah, that's right, mm. who needed money. The the problem is what what uh, the good Lord or certainly what Jesus didn't understand was yeah. is that money lending is an essential part of an economic cycle. Well, he so wasn't that, really an economist, was he? To he wasn't fair. an economist. He he was he was really what you could. I suppose you'd describe him these days without sounding um, insulting or anything like that. A sort of a bleeding heart liberal, if you uh-huh. see what I mean. Right, and so, a Guardian reader. Uh, well, I wouldn't go that far, and yeah. I'm not insulting individual people. But what I'm what I'm saying is that if the moneylenders can't lend money, then people can't go and buy seeds to plant in their field. Mm. And that's where the song "We Plow the Fields and Scatter" comes from. Oh, yeah. We plow the fields and scatter him, isn't it? the good seed on the ground. Yeah. Right. But in order to be able to scatter the seed, you have to be able to buy the seed. Yeah. To buy the seed, you have to be able to borrow the money off the moneylender. Uh-huh. You then put your seed down. You don't grow the seed. You grow it, yeah, and you get your crop, and then when you sold yeah. your crop, you go back and you pay the moneylender back. But don't you get more seeds if you if you if you you know grow it. Yes, you do, but you can't buy your first lot of seeds oh, okay. unless you unless you go and borrow the money. Yeah. So that's that's what that's all about. Now, or about your body, what you will wear. Yes. Now, once again, it's saying, look, get on with life, produce the food first, um, the sustenance of food and drink. What you actually wear doesn't matter, and frankly, that could shame us all these days, particularly you know when. You're going out one night and you say to somebody, you know, do you like my suit? Remember mm. when you were on stage in New York and I said to you, I've got a new suit? Yes. And you said, yeah, it's a very smart suit and yeah. all that. You shouldn't worry about that. It's not big mm. things in life. No. The big thing is to eat and drink and get on with it. Uh-huh. Now, is, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Well, of course it is. That's what I've just said. Yes. What you've got to worry about life is the long-term reason why you're on earth, OK? I'd say, it seems like you're saying you don't have to worry about anything. Well, no, no, the, you, you have to think more than just the present. Yeah. Long-term reason why you're here, and the body more than clothes. What that means is, does it really matter whether you've got a, a, a plastic bin liner on? Yeah. Or whether you've got a, you know, a oh, thousand pound... fancy Italian shirt. Exactly, a thousand pound suit and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Look at the birds of the air. Now, mm. what this means is, do you remember the Beatles song that was found about 30 years after they, uh, they disbanded? Norwegian Wood. F- no, free... As a bird, doom, uh, doom, doom, doom. Vaguely, yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Well, was that, that not a McCartney song? No, it sounded like a Lennon song to me because he was singing yeah. it, and usually whoever wrote it sang it. Uh. So uh, look at the birds of the air. That yeah. means, uh, now, this is goes right back to what I've just been saying about we plough the fields and scatter. The birds of the air do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yeah. which is absolutely they right. They make nests, though. They make nests, but they live on a day-to-day basis. They provide well, each I don't day. Know about he's right. I think he's right. No, about no, that. no, no. The Lord provides for them each day. Uh-huh. They go and find a couple of worms. They bring them back to the nest. Yeah. As you quite right. But making a nest. Yeah, is but just making a, a nest is like making a home. They're not as if they're they're not itinerant. They don't move around. They have a nest. No, yeah, but it doesn't say they're itinerant. It says they do not sow or reap or store away in the barns. So what they're saying is they don't save stuff for tomorrow. Yeah. They have a nest in which they nestle their eggs yeah. so their youngsters can uh, be born. Yeah. And then they provide each day. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Mm. Be a believer. Yeah. Be a believer and you shall be all right. You know, you shall be provided for. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are you not much more valuable than they? Well, the answer to that is that in God's eyes, we are all God's creatures. Okay. We well, are he all... just seems to be saying the opposite, doesn't he? No, no. We are all the almighty's creatures. Uh-huh. Are you not much more valuable than they? Yeah. And finally, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your yeah. life? Now, this is an excellent reference. So don't reference. worry about anything. It's well, basically the message, isn't it? It's an excellent reference to modern life. Do you know that two-thirds of people, or at least half of them anyway, modern life, yeah. suffer from anxiety? I've heard that, yeah. And anxiety means that you're worrying about yeah. things you like... You worry about things, don't you? I do, yeah. I mean, you worry about things like, I think my neighbour's going to be a nuisance yeah. tomorrow, and it's worrying me. Yes. Um, I fear that... Um, you fear poverty. I fear poverty, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Uh, I fear that uh, if I don't get going on maybe 
looking at a new range of cars. My car will start to feel old yes. and, and I need to swap it well, or something it looks like old that. Though, yeah. uh, you get anxiety about things like, mm. should I replace the carpets in my hallway? Really? Because I start to look a little bit warm. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. You start to have anxiety about things like, um, am I investing uh, my, things I have yeah. properly or, yeah. or am I well, losing out? properties you could have problems well, with. Well, all I'm saying is, can any one of you, by worrying, have a single time. hour Can you worry about life? the time as well? Because we're going to. Uh, what I would say is, soon. what I would say is, yeah. by worrying about things, you mm. can extend your life by making your life trouble-free. That is it, Matthew six twenty-five twenty-seven. Okay, uh, Matthew, uh, who's not Matthew six, but Matthew Ocott, uh says, "I love how Porky always laughs when describing scenes of extreme violence and torture." I don't think I do. And Stepto says, "What happened to Trudy?" Well, really? I think we know what happened to uh, Trudy. Yeah. Uh, Porky uh, couldn't keep... That's, that uh, story has been told. Uh, we might go back on mm. it again. And uh, Carl mm. says, just on our way home from a weekend away, listening to you two on our journey from Napier to Wellington. Mm. And that's your two favourite Kiwis, Carl and Tracy. That's Carl and Tracy who came to New York to see us. Oh, right. By okay. the way, do you remember? Napier to Wellington. That yeah. is, of course, in New Zealand. In New Zealand. Not Wellington in Shropshire in England. Uh, well, I don't think so, no, because they live in New Zealand. Exactly. But they came to New York to see us, which well, was wonderful. It was beautiful to see them as Best well. Best wishes Thank you very to much you. We've got lots more coming up yep. in the next hour. song that always kind of makes you feel better. Is that it? Robert Cheers somebody? You You're thinking of Robert Palmer. Robert Palmer. No, it's Huey Lewis and the News. Oh, Huey Lewis and the News. Yeah, okay, Power of yeah. Love. It was the theme song, basically, to Back to the Future, yes. the original. And the reason yes. we're playing it is because Christopher Lloyd, the mad professor, uh, is 79 today, would you believe? The mad professor in Back to the Future. In Back to the Future, yeah, with the big uh, white, you know, all the white, yeah. the white hair, Doc yeah. Brown. The guy who the guy uh, who invented the, pa- the 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 power of you know moving through time in and, a DeLorean and who had the I was going to say the DeLorean car yeah otherwise known as the silver coffins when they were manufactured in Northern Ireland what they were known as the silver coffins why well they were manufactured at this uh, factory in Northern Ireland yeah we used to see them moving through the city to the docks and uh, there well, was why some, were they a silver coffin? well there were some reports of them sort of blowing up and and that kind of stuff really? yeah really a terrible track record. Yeah. Of course, it didn't last long, no, Mr. DeLorean. Well, no, he got mm. caught up in a cocaine sting, didn't he? did, he? yeah. With yeah. the FBI, which wasn't good. Yeah, exactly. uh, now, a couple of uh, mm. shout-outs that we have to do, because uh, mm. we like to do these as we go. Yep. Uh, one is from Pete. He says, can you please give a shout-out to my wonderful mum, June Hydes, mm. as she recently had a very serious operation. She's 89 years of age. What's her name? Uh, June. Well, June, uh, at 89, uh, you're a sterling individual, and I hope it's all gone well, and I wish you many, many years of fruitful life. OK, and David says, can I get a belated birthday uh, good wishes from you, please. I'm a massive fan. I didn't get a shout out on the on the show on Friday. Mm. I was 34 years young last Wednesday. Yeah, it's a bit complicated. Isn't 34, it? 34 years. Who's yeah. that? Uh, it's David. David, 34 years of age. Prime your life, mate. Have a great time. Have a great week. Have a great life. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, now, a couple of other ones. Here's one from Becky, uh, who says, uh, a new business venture, the Two Mics Door Pressing Service. Yeah. Porky can have his face on the door. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. last thing you'll ever see. That's a bit harsh, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a bit harsh. But, I mean, look, I don't mean, mean to make light of these things. It's just quite amusing, isn't it, when uh, uh, these things happen. Um, uh, well, indeed. You, well, you, well, you say that, but I'm not sure mm. if it's amusing. Uh, now, this one here. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, a bleeding heart liberal and guardian reader. Mm. That's genius, fellas. That comes from Scuzzlebutt. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Pete mm. says, uh, has Porky totally lost his marbles? Where did he find mm. a correlation between business cycles and birds? Mm. Is this published data uh, in well, one of your journals? Well, you've got to keep up and, uh, and follow these things. Then you would know. Yeah, Patrick uh, or, uh, Patrick mm. says, only Porky could manage to find a Beatles reference from the good book. Mm. He talked that much dribble, I forgot the passage. Yeah, well, that's... Uh, I'm sorry, you've got to, keep, you've got to concentrate mm. when you when you're going on about these yeah, things, right. OK? Now, let's talk about this professional mourners business, right? Yes. Because you were saying just before we went to the news there mm. uh, that people drop in on funerals. Oh, they do. Where would you get that from? Um, there was a report about 10 days ago about yeah. a woman who went to funerals in the town that she lived in. Yeah. And not only did she go as like a sort of because it, she liked the company of meeting other mourners yeah. and, 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 you know, she was a, a lonely sort of widow. Yeah. 
But, but didn't people wonder who she was, though? No, because at funerals, you've got to remember, when people die, sometimes friends from 20 years ago turn up to pay their respects, yes. so you don't necessarily know them. Mm. You know, you say, oh, yes, you know, we worked together right. in Woolworths or something like that, you know what I mean? That's all you have to say. Yeah. Or, oh, no, no, um, we were at school together, yeah. and, you know, and go back 50 years or something like that. Yeah, but like I that. mean, generally speaking, mm. somebody would know, somebody, if there was somebody from the family, yeah. they would know if you were connected. Well, I find that a bit weird. Well, no, sometimes, if somebody dies and they say they're in the late 80s or something like that, yeah. they may not have have any relatives for all you know you yeah. know what i mean they, well, they usually have children don't they well okay they have children but then you know you say well oh no no um i i'm the person who, who worked with your your mum you know for 20 years in yeah. Woolworths or something like right. that but this particular woman anyway used to just go to about five or six different churches mm. but she also used to take a lunch box right and after well, you know, well, go to the wake and fill up with yes, sandwiches. yes, and take loads of food home and stick really? it in their fridge. Well, yeah. maybe she was poor. Well, well, maybe she was, but she was caught it's not out. Really the done thing. No, is it? she was caught out by a vicar who, who, who you know, said, "I'm not seeing you at another funeral. Didn't you also have a lunchbox there?" Yeah. And and she was just taking sandwiches, putting them into a sealed plastic mm. uh, box, and yeah. taking them home. I told you that story about my uh, my first dog, uh, who was called Ben, uh, who used to live with me when I was married. Oh and yeah, we, uh, we doggy, lived. At, you say? Dog, yeah. Um, What's this got to do with funerals? Well, I'm going to tell you. Right, okay. Uh, yeah. We lived in a little village in Wiltshire, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. the, the sort of the village hall was across the road from where our house was. Yes. And one day, um, and they used to occasionally have little things going on there, mm. and occasionally they would have a sort of a, a reception after the uh, after the funeral. Yeah. Right. And he was a rather big dog, I'm mm. afraid, a bit like Ziggy. Yeah. Um, but he was black. He was yeah. a sort of half lab, half wolfhound. Thing. Right. And um, he somehow got off the lead as mm. I was taking him up the pavement. Yes. Um, as I was taking him, I think he was going to get one of the kids from school or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And he bolted, mm. right, because the door of the village hall was open. Yeah. And they were having like a, a post-funeral, you know. Wake. Wake, yeah. basically, get together. And he, he dashed in there. And he's quite a frightening looking mm. dog, even mm. though he was very nice. Yeah. And just started grabbing all the food that he could get into his mouth. Good God. You know, like uh, jumping up on the... Pa- I mean, it was terrible. He jumped up on the table. Almost like uh, the uh, the scene of a dog in the butcher's yeah. getting a string of sausages. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he jumped on the table. He, mm. was, getting, he was getting... You could hear people screaming. Mm. I was outside going, I don't know what I'm going to do here. I mean, it was awful. Because Shocking. I had to go in and get him. Mm. And some of the people who were in there knew me. Yeah. And thought this was the most disgraceful thing well, that had I, ever I'm happened. Not, I'm not surprised. You know, and I had to wrestle him away from the sandwiches. And he completely ruined the spread. Not surprised. Because he put his big paws all over everything. Do you remember, and I don't know the name of the film, there's a film, Paul Newman yeah. played a, an ambulance chasing lawyer. Mm. And he used to go to funerals. Yeah. And he used to introduce himself to the widow all right. the time as saying... Hello, Mrs. Smith. You right. know, my name is... I was a business partner of your husband. Oh, right. I don't and, think I've seen that. And if you need any help with uh, his uh, estate, you right. know, if you need any help with the, the you know, the uh, arrangements right. afterwards, here's my business card. OK. Your husband will be happy. And was that he a shyster? He was a complete shyster. Right. He, he was literally an ambulance chaser. He, he just spent his day going round to funerals and pretending But what was be, in it for him, though? Uh, that he would get the business then to ex- execute the will. Uh-huh. You see what I mean? Right. And, and, and then scam off a you know a percentage of the money from the widow fee. and all that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, and all that kind of stuff. Shocking. You know? So well, what's the I mean, story this, about this, professional mourners? Well, then? this business is, is in Essex, right? It's called Rent a Mourner. And what they say is... They, no, it's they, not a proper business. It is. No, it can't be. They will provide professional discreet mourners to attend funerals, make small talk, and convincingly mourn the passing of beloved friends and family. Basically... To to, uh, to kind of make it look as if because some people when they die as you yeah. quite rightly say they might not have any friends in the area no. in order to, for there not to be you know sort of basically no one there mm. or maybe just two or three people there mm. these people will will provide a whole bunch of of, uh, of anonymous people who will make out that they knew the the loved one as yeah. it were isn't that weird. Uh, what do these people do when they're not professional mourners? Well, I mean, how could anybody well, take well, a job as a professional mourner? Well, they could be actors, couldn't they? I mean, if you were if you were an out of work actor or yeah. actress, right, yeah. and you were in between, you know, mm. commissions, you could mm. easily go and rent yourself out. I mean, like they've done this thing in Japan, haven't they? Where you can rent yourself out to be somebody's friend. You yes. can rent yourself out to be anybody. That's terrible. No. no it's absolutely terrible. Mm. I'm just reading some detail about it on my uh, my uh, magic machine here. Your magic machine? Yes, it's been running since 2013, yeah. apparently. Well, apparently the Victorians were renowned for their fascination with death and extravagant experience. Oh, I mean, you're were. the opposite, because you hate death and you oh, hate yeah. talking about can't it. Stand you it. hate thinking about it. One thing I can't stand from the Victorian era is to see a funeral where they've hired a glass coach. Right. With the coffin in the back being drawn by two black horses, yeah. you know, with all sort of white stuff on them. Yeah. That's well, that's so... like the old East End thing. It is. You yeah. still see that oh, now. You still dreadful. see it. I can't now, stand now it. how about this, right? In Victorian times, they mm. used to hire mutes mm. to guard the actual uh, coffin and accompany it to the burial site. I don't know why you'd have to be a mute. Why I don't know why mutes, that would be uh, a, a thing. 
but you wouldn't be able to speak, I suppose, so it would be nice and quiet. Isn't that weird? Don't, I don't get that, yeah. The whole funeral thing I can't stand, you know. Have you um, planned your funeral? No, no, no. Because, I mean, nothing worse than getting something through the post. You must get them as well. Uh, where uh, you get, a, you know, one of no. these all-round things that get sent out to just, people. I just throw them away. Would you like um, to start a funeral plan? The talk about funerals, by the way, yeah. there was a um, detailed um, story, which I came across this week, yeah. about the monster, Ian Brady, oh, yeah. the killer, yeah. who has still not been dispatched because... Well, they don't want him to be put anywhere, do they, really? They, well, they can't, either they can't find an undertaker who will deal with it mm. because it would destroy their business yeah. if they were suddenly discovered to have been the people who... Uh, don't they have the... a sort of um, state organisation that no, does that? No, they don't. This is the point. Really? They have a state uh, funding for people who, who don't have money to pay right. for their own funeral. Right. But they, there is no such thing as a sort of, you know, a government undertaker's right. uh, service. Because like when Fred West <laughs> yeah. died, he hanged himself in prison. Yeah. Presumably the prison have got some way of disposing of the body, haven't they? I, I assume they have, yes. But, I mean, what I'm saying is Fred West was Fred West. And I think at the time he hadn't been convicted, had he? Oh, no, he had. Yeah, because they had the trial. Because remember, the trial was horrendous. I thought he was on bail. No, I'm pretty sure that... Uh, I he was on bail, and that's why his well, wife ended up taking the, the rap for all the... Kill, well, the I mean, I certainly certainly there had been a lot of tr- a lot of court case time. Maybe yeah. it was in the midst yeah. of that, but I don't yeah. think so. I think he had been convicted. I didn't think he had. But anyway, 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 we're fine. Hmm. But anyway the point is that um, uh, Ian Brady, had tr- had, had, he had a lawyer who was paid for out of state funds, right? Because yeah. everybody d- is a title to a lawyer. Mm. And this lawyer then unveiled this plan that he wanted, this elaborate funeral with all sorts of requiem masses and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. But terminated very cruelly with his ashes being spread on Saddleworth Moor, mm. which, of course, is where he murdered the children, yeah. five of them, yeah. and buried them. And where one is still supposedly possibly yes, buried. Yes, ex- ex- exactly. Ab- yeah. Absolutely right. And, you know, the whole thing was such a, a horror, so disgusting, that nobody has touched it. No. And now the conundrum is, what do you do with such a, an evil man yeah. who is one of the families of the... One from Steptoe says, Porky's in far better spirits than I was expecting. Well, it's because well, of all this well, talk of death and torture. No, no. What it's you, cheering him up no end. No, it's not, no <laughs> that's ridiculous. It's not. But what are you expected to do? What are you expected to do? What do we do now? Go around bashing our head against brick walls and, you know... Well, you did issue a very amusing tweet earlier right? in the day. Well, didn't you? It, it wasn't amusing. It was how I felt at the time. No, I know, but it was a fairly honest tweet, though. Yeah, it which was. Which I should read out to you, I yeah. think, because people okay. who didn't see it yeah. should. Uh, ever felt like repeatedly punching yourself in the face, stamping on your own feet and setting fire to what hair you've got left. Mm, mm. A lot of people responded to, to that by saying, yeah, I felt like that last time you did a show on your own. Oh, that's very nice, isn't it? Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> well, luckily, when we do our shows on talk radio this week, yes. uh, you'll be with me. I will indeed. But if you're not, Looking I could still do it that. myself and the figures would go up. So you can say. As they did last time. Indeed. This mm. is Talk Sport. Yeah. We are the two mics. Got this from uh, the Porky. Somebody calling themselves Porky's Up Holsterer. Right. Says, Can I have a shout out to my wife, Helena? She used to hate listening to you guys, but now she loves you. Oh, that's very nice. That's Thank often you, the Alan. case, isn't it? Yes, People indeed. start hating us and then love us. That's right. There we... are other people who started loving us and then hated us. Yeah, well, that's right. We turn them round. My ex-wife being one of them. Uh, oh, is that right? Yeah, well, I can well, understand Well, she loved me that. at one point. You yeah, know. exactly. Yeah. What was this record? Uh, this is record. I'm not sure what it's called. Um, why, why are you playing it? Uh, keep on moving. I think it's called. Keep on moving. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Keep on moving. It's yeah. a good song, isn't it? You don't like it? Well, I just wonder why we're playing it. There has to be a reason for us playing a track on this. Well, we don't yeah. always play. Well, I think no, there we should be. There's always a reason why we play. Songs. Now, listen. Let me tell you something, right? Yeah. The world is changing in terms of how we get around. What Did do you, you mean? Well, the use of private jets in this country is growing at the rate of 5% a year. Private really? jets, yeah. Well, we were on one earlier this year, weren't we? We were. We were on uh, Mr. Uh, Sir Rod Stewart's yeah. uh, jet. Uh, let me get this title right. Yeah, Sir Rod Stewart on his jet earlier this year. We certainly were. And uh, went up to Glasgow. Very um, nice experience that was Funnily as well. Funnily enough, my daughter was round and hadn't been to my place for a while yeah. last week. Right. Came over for dinner. Yes. And she found the mints that were uh, supplied from the uh, private jet. Really? Because uh, you know where we... Did ca- you take some? Well, there was... 
the, where we had the coffee yes. in the morning before we got on the plane. At the t- uh, in the terminal, in yeah. the private terminal. Yeah, yes. they, yeah. they had some, some mints, which, oh, okay. uh, which came in a little packet, right. which said, you know, um, uh, what was it? Um, Stansted Airport Jet Lounge or oh, something I like see. that. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. Which, and she was very impressed. I let her take them away. Oh, right, that's nice, yeah. It was a nice little memento. Nice little memento. Why are you looking at me as if there's something weird about taking the mints? Well, you've had them for months. Why didn't you just put them in your mouth? Well, because they, I have an ashtray at home, right? Yeah. Which I don't use any longer for ash because right. yes, I don't I smoke see. anymore. Yes. And I have a few little trinkets in it. Oh, and one I see. of them was this packet of mints. I've never yeah. eaten them. Yeah. They were just sitting there. Okay, yeah. Mm. You got a problem with that? No, just a bit odd. It's like I've got a load of lighters, which I don't know what to do with. Well, maybe I should out. give them to you. No, well, why? Well, because you smoke, no, and no, I don't. Don't be ridiculous. Well, the picture of you smoking's been out there for yeah, about a I'm week now. He's holding somebody else's cigarette. No, you were. Now it says the number of Brits booking private jets has rocketed, fueled by cancelled commercial flights and airlines going bust. Right. Right. Well, how many people can afford to fly in a private jet? Though? Well, the thing is, you know, if you do it right, it's not that expensive. If ten of you were going to Prague for the weekend, yeah, on like a stag weekend, oh, yeah. things I don't go on. You, you don't know. go on. No, those. I don't. I no. don't. No. Well, I mean, it's not used to you. You don't go anywhere. Well, no. But I mean, ten of you hiring <laughs> a private jet to get over there and then come back, it would work out just about club class uh, 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 flight anyway. Well, you say that, but yeah. the reason people go to Prague for stag weekends mm. is they're not paying club class fares. Yeah. They're paying like twenty five quid. Yeah. To go Ryanair or easy. Well, anyway, it says... What do you mean, that, anyway? Well, I'm going to read these figures to you. Go on. There were 78,775 UK private jet departures in August, yeah. right? How That's many? This year. 78,785 wow. UK private jet departures. Yes. That's a lot of jets flying around. That's an okay? awful lot of jets flying yeah. around. Yeah. Um, does it say where they're all going? Up 5.5% on this time last year. And uh, the average cost... This is quite uh, interesting. The average cost yeah. of hiring a private jet for one flight yes. is £10,400. For one flight. So if you wanted to fly, for example, to Glasgow and back, yeah. that would be two flights or would that be one? Uh, or would that be considered uh, two flights? I suppose it would be two flights, wouldn't it? It would be two flights. I know that from my mm. sister, from her days of you know the golden age of, yeah. of Wall Street, That's right. when you know it was a bit like that Leonardo DiCaprio sure. film, The Wolfman of Wall Street, yeah. you know what I mean? That she had a lot of bosses who mm. would fly to Scotland every year, right? And instead of flying first to play class golf. to play mm. golf, and instead yeah. of flying first class, they mm. would they would rent a Learjet mm. and they would fly it to Glasgow, right? Because it would end up about for them because they were going first class sure. on commercial. Sure, it was actually better. It was it was more. Yeah. It was cheaper actually. It, it was cheaper, but it's also much less time consuming. Yeah, because as we found out well, with uh, Sir Rod, yeah, you take off when Sir Rod says, "Right, are we ready yeah. to go?" Well, you also don't have to mess yeah, about going right. into the terminal no, exactly. and going through security. With everybody else, and then wait an hour and a half in a departure lounge. <laughs> you go when I you're mean, ready. I did say to the pilot as we yeah. got off, I said, "This yeah. is amazing. This is, I can't fly any other way now." No, exactly. You know, I'm spoiled for forever. Exactly. But is this, this increase not partially due to the increase in, say, football? You remember when Sergio Aguero went yeah. over to Amsterdam, yes, uh, and and got himself injured in that taxi? That's right. He, he took a private, a private jet. jet. That's right. Well, it says um, it has been worked out that the cost can be effective. If the bill is split with other passengers, depending yeah. how many there are on board. Yeah. Anyway, somebody called Carol Cork, lady, obviously. Great name. Who is, yeah, that's right, co founder of private jet booking service Private Fly, yeah. said the airline experience. Mm. Uh, or, or the lack of it these days yeah. has tipped the balance. Yes. So, you know, if you're, if you're being squashed up in a Ryanair flight which doesn't even take off anymore... Well, the trouble now is, yeah. without wishing to in mm. any way jeopardise the future sort of uh, you know economic viability yes. of Ryanair, yes. an awful lot of people who I've spoken to mm. have said, we're not going to book Ryanair anymore because we don't know whether the flights are going to go. So, therefore... You know, yeah. we have to, you know, that, that, that's one sort of budget airline yes. already cut off, isn't it? And a lot of people have been let down, of course. Mm. Now, this made me think yes. that maybe on our next mission uh, outside of London, yes. where we both live, uh-huh. we might have to take the two mics uh, Lear. Uh, we, we haven't got one, though. Well, no, I thought we might acquire one. Acquire? Yeah. How do you mean that? Well, I mean, like, hire one. A hire one? Mm. Well, you want to waste a load of our money on hiring a private jet. I would love that. I would love to say if, for <laughs> instance, our next um, show was going to be in Dublin yes. or something like that. Okay. I think we should put that into the sort of financial structure of, uh, well, of getting there. Well, I mean, there are many ways to do that, of course, mm. I suppose. I mean, I mean, some people have just uh, said before we did the New York trip that we yeah. should do one of those um, 
private, like sort of larger transatlantic type private jets. Yeah. Like the 35, 40 seater ones. Uh, yeah, we could do. Like that's... there's one, because there's one that goes from beat British Airways from City Airport, right? Yes, that's right. Which I think has about 45 seats. Yes, or something I, like that's that. right, yeah. And the idea was that we would uh, charter mm. it effectively, mm. but mm. everybody who was coming to watch the show would be paying Would for come it. and pay for <laughs> it. Yeah, well, yeah, well, uh, that's a, it's asking a bit much, that I think. The point is, what I have. Yeah, but we could entertain them while we're on the plane. Well, I suppose that's true. You yeah. could get that guy who told you to F off the, that's uh, right, yeah. the American yeah. guy. Yeah, go F off. Yeah, go F yourself. Yeah, really nice guy. You guys well, you got get a, a megaphone. Yeah, you guys got a megaphone. Yeah, very pleasant man. Yeah, what a nice guy. Now, I've got a note here from Mark. I don't mm. know what he knows or why he's sent me this, but he mm. says, Cooman has been sacked. Announcements in the morning. David Unsworth will take temporary charge. Um, now, that's nothing more than a rumour, as far as I know. Well, uh, that is nothing more than idle gossip, honestly. Really? It's, it's idle gossip. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, standing it up and I'm not putting it down. What I'm saying is there's a lot of talk like that going around on Merseyside at the moment. Yeah. And I've had a few messages myself yeah. and I haven't passed them on because I think it's a little bit irresponsible. Okay. But, but, but no, you're absolutely right. That's what people are talking about. Mm. David Unsworth actually is interesting yeah. because I don't know if you saw in the run-up to the game today, but Tony Bellew came into the ground. Oh, I didn't see that. To take no. his seat. Right. And uh, Teddy Bellew, of course, the boxer and big Everton fan. Yeah. Uh, Fighting but, his uh, rematch abs- on the same night as our uh, show at ab- Shepherd's ab- Bush. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. And he came, uh, you know, into... It wasn't the director's box. It was an area just behind the director's uh-huh. box. And he came down the steps, turned left to go to his seat. And the man who stood up and greeted him with a huge bear hug was David Unsworth. Oh, is that right? Who, of course, is in charge of Everton's under-21 team, uh, which has been very okay. successful. All right. Mm. Uh, Oliver says, in Brexit Britain, presumably the lady hanging around stealing food from the funerals is a remourner. Remorna. Remorna. I like it. That's quite I good, like isn't it? it. Very good, yeah. Quite clever. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so, sorry, just so, to get back uh, to so our So how jets. far are you going to take this plan? Because uh, by the sounds mm. of it, you're looking to spend at least a minimum of 10,000, possibly 20, mm. flying to do a show in somewhere well, like Dublin. It, it makes common sense. We take well, all our, our technical crew with us. It doesn't make we any sense few, at all. We take a few favoured uh, fans, as you quite rightly say, who want to pay a bit more for their well, seat. Well, you think we are Led Zeppelin? Stuff. Well, no, but this is the bond I'm going to make to you because I've researched this. If it's, it's going to cost twenty thousand quid, right? I can tell you exactly how to save about eighteen and a half thousand. It's not that expensive mm. to have the livery changed to the two mice. Oh, so you want to do that as well? We could jet into Dublin, yeah. right? And people would be there with their binoculars on right. the perimeter of the airport. Why? Saying, it's them. It's them. <laughs> Come on, it's the two mice. Why would, why would people know? be on the perimeter of the airport with binoculars? Because they'd be watching for the the two mics jet coming like in. You plane know. spotters. Yeah, you mean. no, not plane spotters. But have you, you lost know. the plot altogether? No, no, I haven't. No, you've gone gaga. You know, this is why he's so calm. By the way, you've actually gone when, mad. Uh, funny enough, when I was in Dublin and we were waiting for the Pope to arrive, that's <laughs> exactly no, no. It's true. Did he have his Pope on the picture of himself on the plane? No, no, Who he comes didn't. The Pope, but Pope you Airways. But you don't believe we're all waiting there, and all of a sudden this air. Lingus Jumbo, you yeah. know, comes into view, and they actually did, you know, a sort of a wing wave type thing. You know what I mean? Really? And well, there's the Pope. Yeah, here's the Pope. Yeah, we're the two mics. And, that, and then they circled. Getting yourself slightly above your no, no, station. No, they circled round, right? Circled round, then came back and 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 took one or two dummy runs into the airfield. What and in a jumbo? Ca- in a jumbo? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm certain. Yeah, and mm. then came down and landed. Don't you remember the very famous picture of them? They they took the steps up to the side of the plane, yeah. and the door opened. Uh, Pope John Paul yeah. came out, got to the bottom. What did he do when he, he got to the, the He kissed the ground. But kneeled he always does on, that. Kneeled on the ground. And he always does that. Yeah, but that was his first overseas trip. That's the first time he ever did it. Yeah, but he always kissed the, the ground wherever he goes. But that was the first time, oh, you what? idiot. I witnessed Why the first... You an idiot? Because you're going on, he always did it. it was but the he first, does. I've just told you it was the first time he did it. Well, it was his first overseas trip. Well, I'm not trip. kissing the ground. Yeah. I'm not flying in a private <laughs> yeah. jet that what? you've made me pay for. Why not? Yeah, I mean, if you want to buy a private jet... Can't you see it now, you know? Well, yeah, but if you want to... I don't want to pay for it. You know, people looking into the air. Yeah, but that's care about is what people look at you and think all of a sudden people see sparkling lights it's them it's them knowing you you'd probably knowing you it'd probably crash Mm -hmm. and burn some horrible (laughs) fireball because the porky uh, jinx would hit the the two mics jets i think the uh i think you know and as it landed it would say the two mics on the side you know and um i think that's what happened when abba went on their first overseas tour they went to australia yeah and again, so the two examples you're using are Abba yeah. and the Pope. And the Pope, yeah. And, and us. <laughs> yeah, well, that's I mean, right, you know, yeah. things are going well, but not going that well. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to admit, <laughs> Abba were one of the world's most successful ever groups. Yeah, and they were true. going to probably make about 25 million quid yeah, of a yeah, tour sure. of Australia. But they, uh, they, I think Qantas, uh, you know, got on the deal and said, we'll fly you to Australia, don't worry. And they gave them, like, you know, old jumbo jets yeah. themselves with all their entourage. Well, and well they talked stuff. to our friends at BA, and maybe they... they'll give us the city airport one. Well, yeah, no, that's a good idea. We will talk to our friends at BA. They yeah. were, they 
were very happy to have us on board, by the mm. way, and uh, really loved um, some of the video footage we sent them afterwards to commemorate yeah. uh, that epic visit. OK. Yes. Uh, in fact, here's one here from mm. Uh, mm. Raphael, mm. Uh, who's a BA GGL member. He says, the BA flight is a 32-seater A318, all business class flight. Yeah. The flight stops in Shannon. Where you can pre-clear U.S. immigration, so there you brilliant. go. Brilliant. So we can go to Dublin that way. Oh yeah, that's brilliant. How yeah, about we'll that? have to. You see, it's, it's all coming together. The yeah. karma is working. Do you remember? I was talking about flying to Dublin. The BA flight yeah. goes through Ireland. Is all... that? Um, yeah. Is that? Do you remember when you when you did that Pope thing? Was that yeah. Knock Airport that he flew into? No, was... no, no. It was Dublin Airport. Because who was? Because Knock Airport was built, was it not, for a specific trip? It was, bu- and no. it was all a bit of a white elephant. No, it? it was built, and I think that was for the youth rally where they were all singing, he's got the whole world in his hands. Who has? He's got the, the Pope. Oh, right. He's got so the whole another pope. world. No, it's no, the same Pope. Pope well, John he went Paul. to two different airports. He, he flew to lots of places in Ireland. Right. Once he got down in Dublin and mm. he did Phoenix Park and all that, then he was flying to Knock, he was flying to... But I thought Knock was specially purpose-built. Mm? It's a long way to get there. Yeah, like I, thought, I, thought, um, yeah. I thought that um, they mm. built Knock specifically for a particular visit. Yeah, though. I think they did. Well, that wasn't your one. You wouldn't fly from Dublin to Knock, would you, in a jumbo? Well, not in a jumbo, but the jumbo brought it was an Al- it was a, an Aer Lingus that brought him from Italy, where he lives, yeah. in uh, the Vatican. Vatican City. Right, yeah, that's right. Yeah. got airport. But then they had a smaller plane to get him around Ireland. I'm glad see. we cleared all this up, yeah, yeah, by yeah, the way. Yeah. Now, coming up next, we're going to go across to Austin in Texas because we're going to talk to Rachel Brooks, who's Sky Sports uh, for all the one correspondent. We're going to find out from her uh, how Lewis Hamilton was mm. and how uh, it's all going to carry on, apparently, to Mexico before it's decided whether Lewis Hamilton's actually won it all. This is Talk Sport. November is coming to Talk Sport, and over the next few weeks, Hawksby and Jacobs will be joined by some of the sport's biggest names as they prepare to join the fight this November. You too can be a difference in a man's life by getting involved and growing a moustache. That's absolutely right. Now, plus, this year, it's not just about growing a mo. Anyone can get involved by getting active, active with Move. Now, set yourself a distance, a goal, a walk, a run, a cycle, swim or row, and get, you, get yourself in shape to achieve. It's not about being the fittest or the fastest. It's about doing something good for your health while doing something great for men's health in general, OK? So get involved by signing up to Grow a Moustache or move for Movember to raise funds and help stop men dying too young. Head to movember.com right now. This is TalkSport. We are the yep. two mics. We're going to have heroes and villains coming up in a little while. Sandra Lee's going to be joining us from down under shortly as well. But right now, we're going across uh, to the home of the US Grand Prix uh, in Austin, Texas, of course. We're going to talk to Rachel Brooks, who is Sky Sports Formula One correspondent. Rachel, a very good ball, a very good afternoon to you, I should say. <laughs> good afternoon. How are you guys? Yeah, very, very well, well, thank you. Very well indeed. Now, it was a couple of hours ago, I suppose, maybe three, that uh, Lewis Hamilton won the US Grand Prix, but didn't quite uh, do enough because it's got to go on to Mexico, hasn't it? It is going to go on to Mexico, but he only needs to sort of finish fifth or better in Mexico, and the fourth title is his. And if you've heard sort of Sebastian Metal talking after the race today, he knows it's over. He's very down and very flat. Uh, when he's been talking to the media and uh, said we just didn't have the pace and by the sound of it didn't expect them to have it again this season to be able to match Mercedes at all. Yeah, Rachel, I don't know why I saw that and I don't know why um, Sebastian Vettel is so feeling so morose. It was obvious that he had very, very little chance of winning it from two races ago, really. And um, he hasn't got the machine. Uh, Mercedes now will have their fourth consecutive uh, win. They seem unassailable. I suppose it must be because Sebastian Vettel is such a competitor that he feels another year's gone by and he's, uh, he's out the running again. Definitely, Mike, and I think it's, it's always easy to say what if, but, but you know, they've had some problems with the reliability at, at Ferrari and that's cost them dearly. And then, you know, he, he gave a very honest interview with us earlier today about how, you know, there were things that have happened this season that maybe, you know, he, he says in Singapore he only saw Max Verstappen so he was closing him off, didn't know Kimi was there. But when you look back, it's easy to say, do you know what, that wasn't my fight that day. I should have maybe stayed clear of it and I'd still be in the battle right now. So, 
I, I think he, he will look back on various points, but there's no denying that the reliability of the cars let him down this year as well, and that's why he's not still fighting. Mm. But, but Lewis hasn't been that happy with his car himself, has he? I mean, he's had several kind of blips throughout the course of the season yeah, where he's mostly, complained. Mostly in uh, setting the pace rather than yeah. the race itself. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but quite often, you know, you've been going into yeah. a race with, 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 uh, with Lewis saying he's not happy with the car and they've still got tweaks to do. Does that mean that come next season the car's going to be even better? Well, you always have to remember with Lewis, he says those things, but he pulls out a lap on Saturday seemingly out of nowhere. So um, we take them with a pinch of salt in terms of just the extent of the problem. Right. You know, to him, it's, it's, it's very much, it feels like a big deal. But actually, Mercedes are so good at getting on top of these things. And they've only really had a couple of races where they haven't been able to, to really come away feeling confident after maybe a Friday running or Saturday running. But also their reliability has been phenomenal. Lewis hasn't lost a, hasn't not finished a race all season. Valtteri had the blip in Spain where his engine went. But otherwise, their car has been incredibly reliable. And when you're developing a car, when you're building a car, reliability is usually the last thing to come. So that just shows you how far ahead of the game they were in terms of getting the pace, getting the car sorted. And then they were managing to get the reliability under control as well, which far we haven't managed. No, you're absolutely right. Now, Rachel, how big an influence or or how much improved is Max Verstappen going to be next season? Because since that boy first appeared on the 41 scene, I was just so overwhelmed by the maturity of a lad who at the age of 18 was taking on some of the world's finest and he's getting better by the race, isn't he? He is. I mean, he was taking on at 70, Max, bless him. Yeah. He's, um, he is phenomenal and he is fantastic to watch. And I, as much as I didn't want him to start at the back of the grid today, I knew we would see some brilliant racing from mm. him. And that excites everybody to watch. Unfortunately for him, he did get the penalty at the end of the race today. And if they consider he gained a lasting advantage by that move, then, you know, he has to be given a penalty for it. But yes. I think his issue today was that they haven't been consistent this weekend in terms of people leaving the track and exceeding track limits. And he's the only one that suffered this weekend. And it, it was done. I mean, we were watching him in the podium room. We all knew it was about to be taken away from him. He yeah. didn't know. And it was very difficult and uncomfortable to watch as they took him out of the room and replaced him with Kimmy. And, and sure, but those things, those things will, from him. yeah, but those things at his age will make him stronger and better because you know that that's the sort of thing that toughens people up. And 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 he, I mean, he is so burningly ambitious and desperately talented. He's going to be a future world champion, isn't he? I have no doubt, Mike. I think within the next two to three years, we'll definitely see Max Verstappen winning a world title, as long as he's got the equipment under him. Interestingly, staying with Red Bull now to 2020, yep. when we all thought that he would be poached by Mercedes or Ferrari at the end of 2018. Mm. Um, but he's decided to stay with Red Bull, which is interesting because we still don't know who their engine supplier is going to be after Renault leave at the end of next year. And, yeah. you know, who knows who's going to come into the sport for them. But he obviously thinks there will be something there that will help him win a world title. It's well, sure. Well, perhaps he knows something... <laughs> You know something we well, don't. I'll tell you what we did see a lot of in Austin, which was uh, which was sort of roundly rejected by a lot of people on social media, which is not necessarily the yardstick, but it was very razzmatazz, very American, wasn't it? It was almost as though yeah. Formula One Put has now... Put yeah, yeah. But the red carpet was That's out, right, and yeah. you know, there's a lot of helicopters Ra-ra flying girls. around. I mean, did you get a sense that, that there's more of an American influence now because of the new owners? You do, definitely. They've already said that they want every race to be like a Super Bowl. I mean, that's very difficult when there are 21 in a year and you're Mm. dealing with people who are away from home for a very long amount of time and actually exhausted by this point in the season. But having said that, it it did give a massive lift. The problem you have is you have to weigh up between the audience that are there at the track, which may be, you know, a couple of hundred thousand, and the millions and millions who are watching around the world. And are you giving the best value to those watching? I think that's the problem they're going to look at at the moment, or the, the dilemma, essentially. It was fantastic here. The fans loved it here. But I do understand people's comments watching it on TV. And, and I, think, I think they're just feeling and finding their way at liberty. And they're definitely trying to make it uh, more exciting on and off the track. And, and long may that continue. But they'll just find their way maybe mm. one race at a time. Mm. OK, so are you off to Mexico mm. with the cavalcade then, Rachel? Or are you coming back? No, I have a, we have a couple of days here in Austin, then we all fly to Mexico. So, um, yes, we will enjoy America for a couple, a couple of days more, but be in Mexico for the race next weekend, where, you know, failing a, a car failure, it looks like Lewis will claim his fourth title. Yeah. Yeah. And will this fourth title sort of put him, I mean, even further into the, 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 the sort of the annals the of, of, of greatness? Because he, he really has been an extraordinary success, hasn't he? He has, and I think it's, I think particularly, what particularly strikes me about Lewis this year is that he's been able to deal with 
um, when things go wrong in a different way this year. We've seen a different note. He said it himself. He said, I'm handling things differently this year. I'm, I'm, there are things that he does this year he hasn't done before. He's worked harder this year on every aspect, whether it's working with the team, whether it's being at the factory more, uh, whether it's on himself. He's just worked harder all round, and there's a bit of maturity there, and he just seems more at ease and at peace with himself. And I think that's a sign of him growing as a driver as well because he, he takes it on track, and he's just unbeatable. Yeah, I mm. think you're absolutely right. Mm. Well, Rachel Sisson, thank you very much for taking the thank time to Thank you very to much to indeed. And have a great time uh, uh, for the remainder of the season. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thanks to you soon. Rachel Brooks there from uh, the Sky uh, Formula One desk. She's their mm. correspondent over there. Sounds like yeah. not bad old life, does it? Uh, Flying around the world. Well, she's racing. very good at what she does. So, uh, you know, that's what happens when you, you get good at uh, your job. Yes, indeed. Mm. I've got a few uh, per qu- uh, great tweets from people saying, mm. Mm. Uh, Ablaze says, it's good old Porky, the man of the people. Let's yes. discuss private jets, chaps, past the PIMS. Well, it's just something that we were discussing, really. You know, it's an option. Maybe Gary for the says, future. Gary says, Porky's lost the plot. He thinks he's Richard Branson. No. Um, and uh, here's another one from Blaze. It says, Porky's lost the plot big time. As a rule, if anyone compares themselves to the Pope or Jesus or mm. Abba, mm. then I would send for the men in the white coats. Well, I'm not sure about that. Adam has sent us a picture mm. of uh, this fantastic location called uh, the Mias. Yeah. Is that right? Well, no, Mias is a place. Oh, Mias is a place. Yeah. Okay. It's and in southern Spain. And there's a, it's an outdoor sort of theatre, isn't it? It's like an amphitheatre, isn't it? Amphitheatre. It looks that's a little right. bit like the Hollywood Bowl. It looks like smaller. the Hollywood Bowl. It looks very much like the Hollywood Bowl. Mm. And it's saying, uh, get the private jet to your show in Marbella. Mias at this location, yeah. fellas. Look forward to seeing you live. Well, we could stay at uh, Alan Brazil's gap. We, we certainly could, yeah. That may be an option for the future. We shall see. Mm. And Lucy says, brilliant show, listening to the two mics before my early breakfast in Nanjing, yeah, China. that's great, isn't it? In Nanjing, China. 6.20 in that. the morning, isn't yeah. that great? Yeah, very good Remarkable. Indeed, yeah. Now, coming yeah. up next, we're going over to uh, the other side of the world because we've got Sandra Lee to talk to, catch right. up with. We're going to learn about why they've decided to stop making cars in Australia, yeah. why a shark followed a guy around, yeah. uh, and another couple of weird stories from that part of the world. Mm. This is TalkSport. Mm. Something tall and strong Make it a hurricane Before I go insane It's only half past twelve But I don't care It's five o'clock somewhere this is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. This could be your signature tune, this couldn't it? What's that? It's five o'clock somewhere by Jimmy Buffett. It's four in the morning. No, no, no. And once no. more the dawning. That's somebody completely different. Yeah, it this is. This is it's five o'clock somewhere, meaning you can always have a drink, basically, because it's opening time somewhere in oh, the world. I see. Yeah, right. His other famous song is Margaret uh, Wasted Away Down in Margaritaville. Who's you know this? that one? Jimmy Who's Buffett. This? Buffett. Is Jimmy he Buffett. like a country singer, is it? Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah sort of crossover like country. country singers. Yeah, but some of his songs are great. Guys who wear cowboy hats and strum a, an acoustic guitar. Not for me, thanks. Really? A bit Glen Campbellish, you know what I mean? Well, he made a fortune. You should respect people who make money. Well, yeah, OK, yeah, but not my taste in music. I would never have bought a Glen Campbell record. Really? Like a rainstone cowboy. Yeah, yeah but I mean, uh, you've got some of the worst taste in music of anyone I've ever known. Well, yeah, but... I mean, I mean some, I'd like to go and see your record collection one of these days and see what you've got. I threw it away, actually. Well, good. By mistake. By but mistake. A, yeah, I threw it into a tip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what you do with most of the rubbish in your house. Anyway, let's go to yeah. Australia, because Sandra Lee is here. Yeah. Sandra, a very good morning to you. Good morning to you two, Caps. Hi, good Sandra. morning. Obviously, it's a good evening here, but yeah. it's good morning there. Yeah, great to hear from you, Sandra. I hope you're well. Have you been well? Very well, thank you very much. Oh, and good. I hope the same with you two. Yes, it has been indeed. Porky's not very, very well at indeed. all. His team's going down the pan. In fact, uh, they're mm. probably going to be relegated. So, <laughs> But never mind. We're not uh, going to we, be relegated, but we're having a tough time. We're not going to talk about it. He's also been comparing himself to the Pope no, and no, Richard no. Branson recently. No, so not really. We're slightly worried about his mental state. But mm. let's talk about uh, the state of Australia, <laughs> because we saw a story here the other day saying that they decided to stop making cars altogether. What's going on? Yeah, that's right. Um, our very last manufacturing company Holden was shut down on Friday. The last car ran off the production line, which made it 7,600,000 cars made by Holden in 70 years of production. But the car industry here has all but now collapsed. There's, there is not one single car being made in Australia anymore. Ford is gone, Toyota's gone, Mitsubishi has gone, and now the, the iconic Holden is over. Mm. I mean, is is that necessarily a bad thing, Sandra? Because in in the world economy now, where you know it's cheaper to import cars than to make them in Australia, is it a terribly bad thing? 
Well, it's a bad thing if it was your job that's gone because in the last few years, there's been about um, 30,000 motor industry jobs gone. Wow. Luckily enough that um, the Holden company had uh, managed to get new jobs for 75% of their workforce and the others are still looking for new jobs. But it is pretty shocking when you think that it was sort of, you know, a, a romantic notion that we were making our own cars yeah. and to a small degree exporting them. But you're right, the, the cost of the Australian dollar... The high production cost just made it unviable. It was not a viable yeah. industry anymore. Yeah, I mean, in this country, in the United Kingdom, we don't actually have a British car manufacturer anymore, but we make cars here. No, there are still here. cars being made oh, here yeah, by but, foreign companies. Oh, very much so, very much so. And, and we've got engineering skills, and, and, and it's always been worth the while of Japanese companies in particular to manufacture here because of the shipping costs of getting cars from Japanese, mm. Japan to Europe, you know. But, of course, Australia is so far away from everywhere else... That doesn't apply, does it? So it's it's cheaper to ship them in. No, that, yeah, it's that's absolutely cheaper to ship them in, and yeah. um, and the car, the the sort of the small Korean cars, which is absolutely booming here, mm. they're, they're really really cheap to buy, brand new on the road. Yeah. 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 How's the sale of electric cars going? Because I keep saying to Porky that electric cars yeah, the are the future. Australians won't fall for that. And, they uh, won't fall uh, for that contract. Me, excuse me. Over in America, the Tesla, uh, <laughs> the Tesla three is already outselling the Mercedes S class and the BMW seven. What's the, what's the sales of electric cars going like? Uh, really small here. I think uh, they're incredibly expensive. The Tesla here is over two hundred thousand Australian dollars. It makes it really mm. uh, sort of an elite vehicle to own. It, they're just not um, not going off as as fast as they had hoped they would. Okay. Mm. Now let's talk about this other weird story about a diver who became separated from his boat. This is out yeah. in Western Australia, Paul. You know if you saw this one, right? Mm. His name was John Craig, fishing underwater. He was uh, he had to swim back to shore, but he was being stalked all the way by a tiger shark that he thought was going to eat him. Mm. What do you think of this story, Sandra? Quite worrying. Uh, yeah, you would be terrified, wouldn't you? I'm, I'm surprised that um, you know it, he didn't die of a heart attack when he saw this monster shark trailing him. Right. And as you say, it did. It stalked him for a couple of um, kilometres. This man had to set, uh, swim four kilometres to get back to shore, and the shark stayed with him for about a kilometre. So mm. that was a, a big worry on his tail. But interestingly, the shark just sort of trailed him and didn't even threaten him. It was just following him, probably trying to work out what it was. Well, has anybody worked out why the shark didn't attack him? I mean, sharks think that people in uh, wetsuits are like uh, walruses or something, don't they? Well, they would if you were in one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going <laughs> to respond to that nonsense. Um, the, the point is, uh, Sandra, I've always believed that if you were confronted by one shark, you're actually quite safe because you punch it on the nose. It's uh, the the really? big, the big yeah the big problem is being surrounded by a pack of sharks because the first time one of them takes a nip at you and there's blood in the sea then they all go mad. Well, that would be different. You. Well, I guess he wasn't bleeding, was he? Well, no, he wasn't bleeding. That's right. But I mean, you know, one shark. Surely Australian people are taught from a very early age, aren't they? If it's only one shark, you kind of make sure that you punch it on the nose or poke your fingers in the shark's eye or something like that <laughs> as a defence against getting well, eaten, don't they? Yeah, well, that, that is what has been taught to most Australians, but you've got to be in the right position to do it. I think this guy was incredibly lucky. Yeah. He did have his um, spear gun. He was spear mm. fishing. But the bigger question in my mind is, his mate was on board the boat that got swept away, and why didn't he go back and look for his friend? Well, do you know, we have to see, that's a time. very good journalistic instinct you've got there, because mm. there may be more to this story than meets the eye. Maybe his mate mm. shoved him uh, overboard and then just drove off. Didn't want to know him. And yeah, exactly. I wouldn't be going fishing with him again. No. No, but there was a good film made a couple of years ago, wasn't there? Two or three years ago, didn't they make a film about a couple who surfaced from, a, you know, diving, scuba diving, to find the boat had gone? Oh, yeah, that's right. And, yeah. and, and they spent about 14 hours in the water. That, they was quite, by that, was, that was quite a big movie, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and that was based on um, real events as well. Yeah, that's right. True yeah. story, yeah. Absolutely. Also, and eventually, it was quite terrifying. Did you watch it? No, I didn't know. Why not? Should, well, because I, I didn't even have any interest in it. But the uh, the other thing I've picked up from him, <laughs> some of my journals, by the way, Sandra, is that oh, yeah. uh, sharks have, for the first time ever, according to scientists, learned how to leap out of the water and bring down birds flying overhead. <laughs> <laughs> for, for you know, yeah, seriously, rubbish. No, seriously, they have. You must have picked that one up. No. Well, you do see sharks. Um, some of the great white sharks are able to sort of launch themselves out of the water. Mm. And there's a couple of really good websites where you can see some incredible photographs of them, um, literally throwing themselves out of the water up several, up to several feet in pursuit of seals that have dived out of the, that have come out of the water to escape them. Mm. 
No, they hit, they can uh, they can bring birds down now. Really? As well? Yeah. No, yeah. no. It's been it's been programmed. Well, I'll wait and see the video. I think. No. I'd rather talk about uh, <laughs> this strange character called Dave Hughes. I don't know if you know this guy. Apparently, he's a well-known comedian and presenter of a radio show. Right? Do you know about this guy? Yeah, I do. Is it's, he is uh, he it's is he quite is he quite well known because he's done a very stupid thing in my view. Well, that's what I thought too. Because instead of him taking a pay cut, wouldn't you have insisted on your partner in crime on on mm. radio getting um, lifted up to your wage? Mm, exactly. Well, I mean, at the very least, you'd think this is a guy who finds out that his, his female co-host is getting forty percent less than him. Mm. You'd think he'd just give her twenty percent of what he's got, wouldn't you? Instead of asking for his owners, I want mine reduced to, to, by forty percent. By forty percent, what a what a numpty. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I thought too, and he's, he's walking around with a new feminist halo over his head for that very reason. Yes. However, I'm with you guys. But you see, he should have either given her twenty percent of what he of the forty percent that he was owning more, yeah. or he should have insisted to his bosses, she must get the same as me. Yeah, um, I mean, this is why Australia's in decline, um, Sandra. You've got too many <laughs> bleeding heart liberals there now. You know, you didn't used to have any. Now you've got loads of them. It's not good enough. Mm. Terribly sad. No, mm. he's not. And, and also, these two, they're, um, they're, uh, he's got a shocking voice. I don't know how, how he's managed to make it on radio because he sounds like a, a, a cat scratching sort of to get out of a, <laughs> a box. Well, well, well MG's that. done all right. A lot of people say that about Porky, actually. No. But listen, Sandra, we've got to go. Mm. Lovely to talk to you again. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Sandra. Indeed. We will talk to you again soon, but we are unfortunately out of time. Sandra mm. Lee there reporting in from Australia. Always delightful to hear from her. Thank you very much for that to barbed comment towards the end. Mm-hmm. I'll bring in lots more. Ted. Do you know the one? I.e., that means they go home yeah. and they get into their pyjamas yes. and they sit around watching the telly. Yeah, well, I think that's pretty disgusting, Do really. You? Yeah. Because. Um, you never just watch the TV sort of in a dressing gown and all that sort of no, thing? No, I've got. I've, you I've get, told you, you, I've got indoor attire and outdoor attire, and I wear my indoor attire when I'm indoors. Well, what sort of indoor attire? A pair of shorts. Shorts. And, uh, you well, know. Oh, no, in this weather. I, 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 for the first time, I came out of the house tonight yeah. and thought it was a bit chilly. Yeah, well, maybe, but um, I, like, uh, I like that. Um, Tailored shorts, are they? They're just shorts, man. Just like football short, shorts. Uh, yeah, those sort of shorts, yeah. that's right. I mean, yeah. not like yeah, tailored shorts, like with pockets I'm talking about. Yeah, I've got some of those as well. Yeah, yeah I've got all sorts of shorts. But you yeah, wouldn't wear those in the, around the house, would you? Yeah, I would, yeah. Would you? Why not? Well, it's too cold at them. It's going to get no, colder. No, 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 no. I've got central heating. That's yeah. not a problem at all. But I don't put a lot of heating on anyway, because if you put heating on, it makes you fat. As we all know, Does it? you can be yeah, you get obese from having too much heat in your house. Oh, right. I thought yeah. you could get a lot of germs and things. I didn't know if yeah. you could get fat. Well, you it. should always try and um, keep the temperature in your house to that where you feel a little sort of frisson of uh, ooh, you know, sort of and shiver down your back because mm. if you're too warm and too hot, you're absolutely right. It's it, uh, breeding my ground. My father. For bugs. That's why my father would never allow them to put central heating yeah, in well, his house. I, well, I think he's right. And but and, he was a bit, also, bit, bit of a Spartan when it came to that. I mean, I used to sometimes yeah. have to go to bed wearing a hat. Yeah, it's so well, cold. Yeah, okay. Well, he's probably the sort of bloke who would have approved of uh, the education at uh, Gordonstone, where you started each day in a cold bath. Uh, but yeah, not, probably. Not even in a bath. Yeah. You had to jump into like. Oh, he used a, to wake me up a some stone, mornings. A stone, um, uh, like pool outside yeah. the uh, in the garden. Yeah, break through the ice. That's he used right. to wake me up sometimes with a cold flannel. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. Yeah, sort yeah. of guy he was. Yeah, well, he thought it was hilarious. Yeah, but these, yeah, really, yeah. yeah. He used but, to well, I mean, wake me up with this thing and rubbing it in my face, well, cold you, water. I, I, you need that plenty of times these days. This state you go to bed in sometimes after bl- bladderation sessions. Really? So I'm not surprised. I don't think you're in any position at all to judge people's uh, private lives and what they do when they're not at work. Well, you given know, what we've seen of your behaviour you, uh, last weekend, which was absolutely atrocious and embarrassing. Uh, where was that? Uh, well, in one, it was at Brighton Football Club. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, and which, secondly... Which, which was uh, very um, I told respectable. You, well, no, we've got plenty of pictures of you holding a massive glass of uh, wine. Yeah, holding right? a glass of wine, not drinking uh, not, it, holding oh, a glass so, of wine. So yeah, that's it. it. We've, also, we've also got eyewitness accounts of how you were nearly thrown out, which you've explained. Rubbish. Um, we've also got eyewitness accounts of how bladderated you got. Mm. And then, secondly, on the Monday, uh, when you took out this supposed you know, business partner of yours, yes. uh, where you were smoking. And drinking vast amounts. No, I wasn't. I wasn't drinking vast amounts. I wasn't smoking or holding somebody's cigarette. Nice now, up. the thing I can't stand about people in pyjamas is seeing somebody in the street in their pyjamas. Yeah. It's a very northern thing, but is when it? I used to drive the Corona Pop Wagon... Yeah, someone that's used a to, long time ago. So, yeah, someone used to come out, you know, they'd open the door to their council house, come down the pathway, yeah. and actually come to the... And I said, it's all right, love, don't worry, I'll bring you a pop to the door, and I'll pick it up now. Not only well, so would people they, would come out of their homes to, to get the, the drink off you. Yeah, that's right, yeah. 
Now, not only did they have their pyjamas on and their dressing gown, they also had their slippers on. But what's your... And the most your... disgusting thing in the world mm. is to wear your indoor slippers, walk out of the house, down the path, onto the pavement, yeah. you know, where other people are walking mm. in their outdoor shoes all the time. Yeah. And then to take two bottles of dandelion and burdock, turn round and take them back into the house but your... while your hair is in curlers <laughs> with a net on it and holding a cigarette in your mouth. Right. Disgusting. Well, that's just you being a snob, though, isn't no, it? No, it's not. But I thought this pop wagon business of yours, I thought you just were delivering it to shops. I didn't think you were actually delivering it to people's houses. No, you don't deliver to people's houses. Really? Absolutely. Well, how do you know they want any? You knock on the door and say, do you want Oh, so you're actually lemonade? selling it door to door? Yes, absolutely. So you're not going to people who might have ordered it? Well, well, you had Whoa. you had your regular customers, right, right? Which you called on every week. Well, how but much pop did they drink? These people, a couple of uh, they would have a, a lemonade and lime, yeah, and a, and a dandelion and burdock or a cherry a. And they actually allowed you to collect the money from these people. Of course, yeah. They took it back to the depot. But the point is, because I was entrepreneurial, mm. I didn't just go out and knock on all the doors that were in my log. Right. You were given a log for your round. A log. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I would I would say. So your sort of manner. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I would go knock on a few other doors and say hi. Uh, you know, I'm Mike Parry. I'm from Corona. I've got a I'd great like bottle Parry. of dandelion. Why did you have to tell me your name? Well, because I would. You know, <laughs> I've got a bottle of dandelion and burdock here for you. Only seventy nine p or Did something you say like that. You give it knock off rates, presumably. No, 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 no. Well, what no, about the time you told me that you sold somebody off the back of the lorry to swap for something else? Well, to we some other guy used to rendezvous sometimes in pub car parks, and I would swap a case of lemonade yeah. for a case of beer from right. the man with the beer lorry. Well, was that not more expensive though? Well, nobody knew because it was all knockoff stuff. And uh, so, how did you explain the missing uh, case of pop? Well, I didn't. I didn't have to explain it. You know, I, I, I sort of uh, creative accounting in my log. Really, you know what I mean? And well, uh, did they not sort of have any kind of supervision of you? Oh yeah, because I yeah, wouldn't yeah. give you. I would yeah, not yeah. give you. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, a length of rope to do anything. And with. then, and then, I would also um, swap. Uh, you know, a few bottles of uh, usually um, ginger Lem- beer. Right. No, usually ginger mm-hmm. beer for six cream cakes. Six cream cakes. Yeah, well, you, bake- you wouldn't eat all of those, surely. Well, I would take them home, and then we'd have them variously, you know. Uh-huh. And um, it's a sh- shocking kind of life of crime that, you've that, led. That with, was isn't from it? the that was from the like the baker's van, mm. you know. This is a life of crime no, that no, you've led. No, 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 I mean, no. Only, only the other night you were telling us about this gang you were in. We used to sort of roam <laughs> yeah, around. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, you know, set fire to things. Well, no, no, That's the, what you said. No, the only thing we set fire to was somebody else's bonfire. Well, it's still setting fire to bigger it. than ours, that was all. Mm. But, um, you know, that was all part of uh, growing up. I wouldn't yeah. worry about it. OK. Now, Here's one, I'm not worried about it. Matt mm. says this. Yeah. Uh, Sharks catching birds. Porky has finally lost the plot. Perhaps he could film this from his private jet. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you say that. I mean, it's quite uh, amusing, really. People can't get their head around the fact that a lot of what we talk about on this show is aspirational, mm. OK? Yeah. And aspirational is good because it means that you should set your sights high in life i mean for instance if you say to yourself one of these days i'm going to reach the stars if you only get halfway there then you've done pretty well really so be aspirational haven't you failed if you haven't no reached no the stars? no no you haven't if really? you're halfway there you've done very okay. well cotty uh, wants mm. us to make an announcement on his behalf okay. he says my wedding band have just cancelled on me can you give me a shout out for any bands local to birmingham please now hang on uh what's this guy's name uh, his name is uh, luke actually luke yeah when is when is the wedding he doesn't actually say when his wedding is but I presume it's quite soon, right? Um, so anyone that's got a band in the Birmingham area, he's looking for well, uh, to help him out and play at his wedding. Funny enough, we mm. know somebody who specialises in doing weddings. We do. Who's got a great band? Yeah, why I? Yeah, but he's up in Whitley Bay he's from he? uh, Whitley Bay, Tynemouth, yeah. Northeast. But he, he, I bet he get all the stuff in the van and get well, down to do. Birmingham very quickly. He might do if yeah. he's able to. He might yeah. have another engagement. Yeah, so we can probably help. Uh, what's the lad's name again? Uh, his name is Luke. Luke, we can probably help you out. We know somebody who specialises in weddings. Literally, he's got a band. And they do uh, they do at least uh, but if one wedding in, a weekend. But if he's not in Birmingham, it might be more expensive though for the travelling. Well, it, it might be a little right. bit more, but uh, probably only the petrol money. But uh, yeah, you you know, if you if you if you're that desperate, pal, we we know somebody's good. Uh-huh. No problem at all. Dave says that five years was the best bit of music ever played on the show. Well, we play a lot of good music on the show. Yeah, we, we do. Yeah, but usually for a reason. Not don't don't just play it at random. You know, well, it just wasn't like played you did. at random. Now I found um, in my journals because yeah. uh, we were talking about we've been talking about aircraft during the uh, the show. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I found a um, a top airport annoyance list. A top airport annoyance yeah, list? Yeah, That sounds complicated. Yeah, the first one is rip-off food and drink prices. Oh, what do you mean? Things that annoy people right. at airports? That's right, yeah. Do you know where the worst example of that was? And I'd have to tell you. What, rip-off uh, food and drink well, prices? Well, just, just the worst kind of scenario yeah. for, for, for yeah. all of that mm. was when I was flying back from, uh, from Rhodes. Yes. Because they have a weird system there mm-hmm. yeah. where if you are supposedly going to go through to a, to a lounge, mm. you have to go through a different bit of the airport. 
Right. So, you know, we didn't do that because right. we wanted to just check in and make sure everything was fine. And then once you're in the other part of the airport, mm. you can't then go and go find back. the lounge. Yeah. And so we were then exposed to sort of having to do what everybody else was doing. The great unwashed masses. But it was terrible mm. because the mm. food was awful. Mm. The bar was terrible. There mm. was, you know, the, it was, I mean, it was all very modern, mm. but it was really badly run. And no place to sit or no what place to What was the air conditioning anything. like? The air conditioning was fine. It was a very right. modern airport. Right, yeah. The air conditioning was absolutely fine. But, but too the, crowded? No, it was just very badly designed, I right. would say. Okay. It was really, it was like cafeteria type design where you got a tray yeah. and you pushed it around and you got what you wanted. Mm. But you couldn't get what you wanted, if you know what I mean. Cause it yeah. was, and there was nowhere, when you went to pay, for example, mm. there was nowhere to put the tray. So, and where so did you, you have, sit and, ha- and eat well, this? and there was nowhere to sit. Apart what do you from, do? You standing up eating off was, a tray? Well, there was basically one set of seats, which mm. had about eight seats on it, like a bar, mm. where you could sit four on one side, four on the other. Mm. And apart from that, you had to go and sit in just an ordinary airline sort of lounge-type waiting seat. And put it on your knee? Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. It was awful. I can, do you know what? I cannot, can't stand people who say, oh, no, we just had um, uh, dinner off a tray on our knee. I would never do that. I think that's the most repulsive thing you, you can't. can do. Yeah, I know, but if you're very hungry and you need to eat something, and I didn't actually have anything to eat because I didn't fancy any no, food. No, I'm talking about at home. People sit in front of their telly and oh, have, yeah. oh, I have a TV dinner off no, a tray yeah. on my knee. Yeah, Ooh, no, I don't who, do that. Who'd want to do that? No, I don't like that. Oh, that's horrendous. No. I think really does that. He's of peasant stock, if you know what I mean. Well, people are not very happy about your criticism of people. John says, yeah. Porky the Plank having to go at Northerners and council people again, even though he lived up north. No, well, he's I, from I, up north. I, know, I never attack northern people. Northern people are the salt of well, the earth, in my view. you just said people who wear pyjamas out on the street tend to be northern. No, I didn't say that. I said northern thing. Look, my pop round was in uh, Cheshire and that's in the north so yeah. I was only using my own personal experience but mm. it happens plenty of times so I've seen plenty of people walking around Dagenham yeah. in their pyjamas and, we lost and Dagenham? well you know whenever I was when were I you remember, in Dagenham? I don't know but I was there I remember seeing some woman walking around in her pyjamas in Dagenham really? so it happens in the south how as about well. this right you can put the two stories together mm. uh, apparently uh, the, fi- the finding of one of these uh, uh, surveys is that one in six Brits actually change into their pyjamas on planes whether it's for short or long haul flights, they would, they, yeah, but they'll be pajamas provided by the airline, no. won't they? No, you know, the, no. This is people who are flying, just flying, say to America. Yeah, they go to the toilet. Yeah, and they're in just ordinary tourist class, hmm. and they come out of the toilet in their pajamas, and they have a little sleep. Well, their own pajamas. Yeah. Why would you bother doing that? Well, because people might feel more able to sleep if they're wearing pajamas. I remember Mr. Brazil telling me once he was going long distance somewhere, and uh, our very good pal Graham Beecroft was on the Beaky. plane. Yeah, and uh, they. Travel, uh, they got upgraded to a good class of the plane, you know, sort of club or first or something. And he's, uh, you know, it was amazed they got a free pair of pajamas. Really? So he went and changed into them and. <laughs> and uh, well, just paraded around? No, not paraded around. I think he actually got his head down, you know, and found it uh, a, an exhilarating experience. Yeah, well, we, I had a little mm. sleep on the BA flight back from New York, but I didn't have any pajamas. No, you didn't. No. In fact, when I woke up, there were two rather large vodkas that you'd procured for me. Well, you'd ask me to go and get them for No, you. I didn't. I asked mm. you for a vodka mm. cranberry juice. Uh, or, then, or something like that. And, and you, you came back with yeah. one vodka and cranberry mm. and a vodka and something else, cherry liqueur or something. Yeah, I wish I hadn't got you them because, you you know, you behave a little bit erratic. It's sent me, sent me, it's sent me a little bit doolally. Yeah. Naomi in Sarasota says, Porky, looking dapper on Sky News last week, was that a Mont Blanc pen I saw in your hand? Uh, yes, it definitely was. Yes, thank you very much And you much know indeed. why she's asking, don't you? Because she sent it to indeed, us. Indeed, she did. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you, Naomi. You've seen the time, by the way. I, I, I have indeed, yeah. Uh, we've got yes, to speak, thank you, Naomi, we've got to speak about gunpowder coming up next with Rebecca Rydall. Uh, because mm. she is an expert on uh, the history of this great country of ours. That's right. And we're going to find out from her whether she thought it was any good. Yes. This is Talk Sport. Atomic. Sunday Time Sportswoman of the Year Awards 2017 take place on Thursday night, and we're looking forward to the prestigious event on Talk Sport with the Sunday Times. Now, in their 30th year, the awards celebrate the outstanding contribution to sport made by elite athletes through to inspirational community volunteers. And there are six leading contenders contenders rather for the Sportswoman of the Year accolade. Eleanor Barker for track cycling, Tammy Beaumont for cricket, Elise Christie for short track speed skating, Johanna Conta for tennis, Jody Taylor for football, and Bianca Walkden for Taekwondo. Absolutely. Now, other awards on the night will go to the Young Sportswoman of the Year, the Team of the Year, and the Lifetime Achievement Award. Listen to Hawksby and Jacobs from 1 o'clock tomorrow for all the build-up to this celebration of sport. The ceremony will be broadcast live on Sky Sports' main event, Sky Sports Action and Sky Sports Mix, a channel available to all Sky TV customers from 8pm to 9.30pm on Thursday, the 26th of October, which in fact is Thursday coming up. 
This Thursday, of course, so keep your eyes out for that. Right now, though, we're going to talk about something a little bit more grisly, I have to say. I was telling you earlier I watched Gunpowder last night, and it really was pretty brutal. I know, but it's a great story, isn't it? I consider myself to have a pretty strong stomach. We're going to speak to Rebecca uh, Radil now, who is an historian, uh, a former producer of uh, historic documentaries. We spoke to her a few uh, months ago about the plague. About the plague. uh, Because she wrote a book about that. Rebecca, a very good uh, morning to you, and welcome back. Hi. Thank Hi, you. Rebecca. Here again. Thank yeah, you very, thanks very, for joining us. very much for joining mm. us. Now, I'm not easily kind of um, made to feel squeamish, but I have to tell you, when I was watching Gunpowder's first uh, episode last night, it did make me sort of cringe slightly watching the, the execution scene and particularly the kind of hanging and drawing and quartering bit. Yeah, it was um, graphic, wasn't it? A bit, a bit more graphic than Braveheart, even I'd say. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I've never really was, seen uh, anything that that you know graphic, to be honest. I mean, yeah, yeah. But the point is, Rebecca and and my colleague here, MG, is that's what used to happen in uh, medieval times. That's why we refer these days to people who are particularly brutal as being medieval. I mean, that's the way it was, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, violence was everywhere um, during this time. And actually, that example that you saw on screen, Mm. um, I won't go into lots of detail, but the woman, well, I mean, she was executed in quite a graphic way. Pressed. Yeah, pressed. That was based on a a real case. I mean, that woman, the woman in the show is fictional, but it was actually based on a... um, a real form of punishment that went on. It was used during the Salem Witch Trials it was. in America, um, but also it was used during the reign of Elizabeth the mm. First um, against a, a, a poor woman um, who uh, was crushed to death used by that method. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, people saw these things quite frequently. I mean, even if, if you're walking around London, you would have seen traitors' heads stuck on pikes. Yep. Um, death and violence was was everywhere. So mm. even though it may have seemed quite graphic, I yep. think it was for me um, as a viewer and someone that knows a little bit about that period. It felt like it should, you know, those things should be there if oh. you wanted to be true to the period. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it is a great, great story, isn't it? One of the greatest stories in the history of um, of our country. And why yeah. not why, why not get it right to the detail? You see what I mean? Because it's a bit like Cromwell, isn't it? You know, paint me, but I want it warts and all. Yeah, true. Uh, spot on. Yeah, mm, it is like that. Yeah. I mean, what? Yeah, there's no point fabricating it because it is such an amazing, as you said, an amazing story anyway. That's right. That's right. Now, you wrote an interesting piece earlier, I think this week or last, in the New Statesman, Rebecca, which uh, in which you said that this gunpowder plot, as it were, this particular show, mm. is a lot more true to what actually happened. It wasn't all about Guy Fawkes. It was all about the kind of co-conspirators. Yeah, well, I, and that's 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 the thing that this show is focusing on Robert Catesby. And Catesby, it, and, yeah. Yeah, and with all the like the literature and the trailers that are going around, they're mm. saying that every plot needs a mastermind. But he really was the mastermind behind this plot. Um, but it's just it's so interesting that it kind of tapped into these deep fears that people had of, um, you know, Catholics wanting to take over again, mm. and this idea of the homegrown other, um, you know, the enemy within, and mm. that's all there. And I think that's part of the reason why the story has endured so much. Mm. Oh, no, oh no, it definitely has. I mean, Guido Fawkes was, in fact, central to it because he was the guy who was found in the cellars of uh, Parliament, wasn't he? He was about to light the bomb and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's a tremendous um, uh, couple of prints that I've seen, um, Rebecca, which shows Guy Fawkes's, or Guido Fawkes's signature admitting his involvement before he's tortured and then a signature after he's been on the rack and had all his fingers mm. pulled out and clearly he was having trouble writing afterwards. Yeah, I, it's 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 quite shocking when you see that and actually the orders for him to be tortured came straight from James the 6th and the 1st as well. So right. he, he sent a message saying um, use the gentler tortures um, to get him to speak mm. but obviously they um, went above and beyond their, mm. <laughs> their job to do that. They did. But the funny... Mm. The, the funny thing about Guy Fawkes, actually, as well, well, I find this funny, it probably isn't, mm. but is that this idea of him being called Guido Fawkes is a name that he gave to himself because he'd been on the continent for a little bit, so um, he changed his name then and uh, came back and he was Guy again. But also John Johnson when he was found as well. Yeah, well, that's, that's right. He wanted to make himself exotic. Now, uh... <laughs> Well, people still do that nowadays, Yeah, of course they? they do. Of course Come they up do. with ridiculous names. A lot of yeah. people on the radio actually make names up and pretend that they're somebody else. They it's do, a bit odd. Yeah. Luckily, we don't do that. No, we don't, we don't do it. We're However, yeah, I quite yeah. like the idea as well that in this piece you say that this was really the first terror attack on, uh, on these shores. 
Yeah, I mean, there's still loads of debate, and I'm sure people will disagree with me about whether it was a terrorist attack. But I think, I guess, my point is that these um, conspirators. Um, wanted a revolution that's what they wanted they want they wanted catholicism to return yeah. to britain that was their ultimate aim so they may not have aimed to um create a terror event they wanted a revolution but actually what happened because this frightened the populace so much mm. it it almost became this um initial terror terrorist attack and the mythology around it um because it was deeply deeply shocking to contemporaries at the time i mean James II was supposed to be in terror and um, at hearing, you know, the, this plot to, of this plot to assassinate him. So mm. it really was a, um, a, a watershed moment in the way that um, people would attack the state and, and that kind of thing. That's right. I mean, as a historian, Rebecca, have you pondered on or come up with a theory about how our country would have shaped up in the hundred years after the plot if the plot had succeeded? Oh gosh, that's a question. Um, I don't know. I don't think the plot. Personally, I don't. I don't think the plot could have succeeded because there were so many ifs and buts. I mean, mm. it was so reliant on so many different things happening. They were going to, you know, if they if they blew up, if they were successful in blowing up Parliament, and mm. um, there are some theories actually that the um, gunpowder was dud gunpowder anyway, so that may not have happened. But then yeah. then they were reliant on an uprising in the Midlands, and mm. they were reliant on other people joining them. They were also reliant on them um, ha- being able to place the um, the king's daughter as the new monarch but obviously the king had sons already so yeah. there were lots of ifs and buts so mm. i think it would have been very hard for it to have been a success yeah um yeah but you know you know how uh, historians are always saying what if uh, hitler had invaded britain you know what the shape well, they've of made britain very now. successful tv shows about yes, that haven't ex- they? Ex- exactly oh, yeah, they exactly so but as you quite rightly say society wasn't quite as stable in those days anything could have happened the the unseen could have happened mm. anyway it failed poor old guido copped for it yeah. and uh, and would you be celebrating november the 5th um, with bonfire nights. Well, I think bonfire nights great as a as a sort of party. You know what I mean? I think as he had to light a bonfire and send a few rockets but in the air. And all us, that. He was telling us just the other day, Rebecca, mm. that apparently there's a load of uh, bonfire specialists walking around investigating to see whether the right kind of wood is being burnt. Yes, and apparently really? some bonfires might yeah. be being shut down by local councils. I'm not convinced it's a true story. No, no it is, Rebecca. For the first time, councils are sending out specialist um, bonfire spotters, and if the wrong sort of wood's on your bonfire and it sends the <laughs> polluted, you know, um, smoke into the air... Or perhaps the wrong but, kind of guy. Yeah, you're the wrong kind of guy and all that. But it's interesting, isn't it, Rebecca, because I don't know where Bonfire Night started originally as a sort of celebration of, you know, uh, saving the monarch and putting down the, the rebellion, but these days it's just a great laugh to get drunk round a bonfire fire, send a few rockets in the air and eat a few sort of roasted chestnuts, isn't it? Of course, you shouldn't be using yeah. or operating fireworks while under the influence of alcohol. Of course not. Or eating chestnuts for that matter. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, I mean, that, that, what I'm saying is it's a long time ago, a bit like Christmas now. It's passed, mm. uh, passed way beyond celebrating what it was intended for, hasn't it? I think so, but I also think some people... I, I was reading something... Um, earlier uh, p- some people think that bonfire night is a celebration of guy fawkes and um, so i think that yeah you're right the meaning has got lost over yes. decades but actually it was celebrated the year after it happened so um 1606 that was the first bonfire night and what they was used it? to do was burn yeah. effigies of the pope instead of guy fawkes oh really actually. oh right yeah and um, so so and they and over the years obviously we know that different people have been Burnt in effigy, Trump, sure. um, Hitler, you know. David Beckham, actually. Well, it, start, it starts to get really? a bit tricky. Yes. Well, it does start to get a bit tricky. And yeah. I imagine in this day and age, as we become mm. more aware, shall we say, of, mm. uh, of offending others, yep. that there might be more and more stories like that. Oh, you can't burn that person. You can't mm. burn this person. Yeah, right? well, David Beckham got sent off in an England game when he, uh, he, he kicked an Argentinian 98. footballer. Yeah, 98. Oh, Next right. day, you've got, like, people burning effigies on him. You know, it doesn't take much for them to get like that, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. peasant uprising is never far away. Yeah. Well, listen, Rebecca, thank you Rebecca, so much thank you for, very much. Uh, for waiting up so late and uh, and uh, not having a drink before you came on the show. You can go mm. and have a glass of wine now. Mm. Oh, brilliant, thanks. Thank yeah, you very excellent. much. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Rebecca Radil, uh giving us the lowdown on the gunpowder plot. So, you see, there you are. That's yeah. why, uh, you know, we talked about the Pope earlier. That's right. Everything comes back into kind of synergy well, in the show, really doesn't does, it? Yeah. And the uh, people burning effigies of the Pope. There's still sure. parts of Britain where they do that, you know. But we better well, not I'm talk sure about that. I'm sure there are. let talk sport. Music can only mean 
mean one thing. It is time, of course, for Heroes and Villains as we go ease ourselves into Monday morning. Uh, we need two heroes and two villains each. Yep. Uh, the judging today will be done by uh, Ross, the Everton fan. Mm. So I hope he's not going to be... Because he was removed unilaterally for the judging of... Um, uh, of uh, the one minute moan the other day. Yes. Uh, before, was it winners and losers? No, I think it was a one yes. minute moan. Yes. It was a one minute moan. Uh, Izzy was uh, judged to do that one because Ross yeah. had proved to be a little bit biased. So I'm hoping right. he's not going to be biased. I hope he's going to throw that mm-hmm. all that to one side. Mm-hmm. Uh, but have you got any heroes or villains that you'd like to propose at this point, at this moment in time? Well, we're both proposing two of each, aren't we? Two of each. Well, yeah, I'm offering so... it to you if you want to go first. No, I'll let you go first. You want me to go first? I'll let you go first. Okay. Well, it has to be uh, Mr. Wagner, the Huddersfield manager, is my right. first hero. Okay. Okay. Because I think anybody, I mean, it was almost like the mm-hmm. uh, the Burnley Chelsea result, which you alone predicted. Yes, the first day, uh, first uh, day of the season, Indeed. when uh, Burnley went to Chelsea and actually beat the champions. Yeah. Right yeah. here, we had uh, nobody really talking about Huddersfield doing anything. Mm-hmm. All that we knew about Huddersfield was mm-hmm. that basically they'd started the season with a couple of decent games, yeah, but then they hadn't scored any goals and they weren't really right. any good and they weren't really capable. Right. And this guy Wagner, who's meant to be sort of yes. you know this fantastic new, new you know German manager for mm-hmm. Huddersfield, um, maybe was wasn't as good as everyone was making him out to be. However, right. uh, you know, they absolutely took Manchester United apart. Jose yeah. Mourinho didn't have many excuses, but, you know, he said that they mm. were the better team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for them to beat Manchester United, I mean, I think Wagner said it was the most important result in the history of yes. his career in football. Yes. So I think he's got to be very, very much in, okay. the, uh, in the hierarchy of heroes this weekend. OK, he's your hero, yeah? He's my first one. OK, fine. Yeah. Now, what do you want me to match up with, a hero or a villain? Well, you can do it one of either Well, I'll or. do a hero. OK. And i tell you who's an unlikely hero this week, yeah. but I'm going to call him a hero because it's going to lead to uh, great joy. Yeah. And that is Mike Ashley, the owner of Newcastle United. Oh, yeah. He has finally decided to sell the club. But I thought he'd now, been selling the club for months. No, no, years. no, no, no. He's finally activated the mm. sailing procedure. Amanda Staveley, who is a financier of uh, repute, yes. you know the lady. She I'm did the Manchester about. City deal, didn't she? She did the Manchester City deal. Absolutely right. She's uh, an incredible woman who uh, wheels and deals in all sorts of assets. But uh, on this occasion, a football club. Um, it looks like that deal's now going ahead. Now, uh, I'm, I'm calling Mike Ashley a hero because he's finally realised mm. that actually the uh, people of Newcastle and the fans who follow Newcastle want something better than the way he's been running it. Yeah. He's, he's a brilliant businessman. He's made himself a billion-pound fortune, but he's not the right guy to run a football club because it just doesn't fit with the way he thinks. Um, so I think he's finally realised that. For that reason, I'm sure that uh, the people of Tyne Tower will agree with me. He's finally taken the shackles off Newcastle United, mm. it's going to be owned by somebody else. Yeah. I therefore nominate him as a hero. Yeah, I don't think they're going to like the look of, uh, of, of, of a statue to Mike Ashley as a hero of Newcastle anytime well, soon. I'm telling you. So I think that's an idiotic uh, no, suggestion. No, it's not. No, it's a, it's a really good one. Okay. Mm. Uh, well, my first villain of the piece this weekend is the World mm. Health Organization. This is an organization yeah. uh, who chose uh, uh, Robert Mugabe, mm. right, one of the world's most brutal dictators, yeah. to become a goodwill ambassador yes. for their organization yes. without thinking, mm. right, without realizing that, in fact, during the first 20 years of his 37 year rule mm. uh, Mr Mugabe may well have expanded healthcare but actually mm. more people have died in recent years as a result of it oh, failing absolutely. than any, anywhere else Not in the world that, he's also you know wrecked his own country well yeah medicines yeah. Uh, are basically in, in, in yeah. short supply some medicines that you can't get at all yes uh, staff are not paid mm. in the country people are eating plastic yeah. in order to live yeah. right yeah. and he also has a, he himself outlived the life expectancy in the mm. country by three decades that's right and he is an appalling man yeah. an appalling bloke well, the mm. idea that World Health Organization mm. even thought it was a good idea to, to, to promote him yep. is astonishing. They've now withdrawn it and said, oh, we've listened to all the outcry. Yes. Well, who runs these organisations? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely. So there's my first villain. Right, OK. Yeah. Uh, so we're now into villains, are we? No, okay. you can do a villain or a hero. No, I'm going to do a villain. My well, villain. We do this every week. My villain is Guiana Gay who is the Everton player who was sent off today in the game You're against You're kind of scapegoating Arsenal. him, aren't you? No, I'm not scapegoating him. I mean, the, you know, the point is, it's a shocking performance. Wayne Rooney could have been a hero, but, you know, I've made him a hero before. But beyond a gay, Everton down to 10 men, I have to say... The, you know, that just finished us off. And, uh, OK, somebody from today's performance has to be a villain. Uh, I'm not going to nominate uh, Mr Cooman just yet. He's the manager. He's got to get his act together. But for one rash challenge 
to put us at a total disadvantage against a team which were on top of us anyway and superior. Silly, and uh, he's my villain. OK. Well, I'm going to have to say that... Uh, yeah. uh, and we'll come back to villains, because I'm going to do a hero. And my hero mm. is Sergio Aguero, mm. uh, who came back to play uh, for Manchester yeah. City after that unfortunate accident yeah. that he had over in uh, Amsterdam. Yes. When he went over to see some uh, Colombian singer, right? Yes. Uh, and got into a taxi which crashed on a, mm-hmm. into a lamppost on its way back to the airport. Yes. He came back sooner than everybody thought. Yeah. Uh, we, he had some problem with his ribs. But he scored his mm-hmm. one. 177th goal for yep. Manchester City, uh, yep. equaling the club record, right? Which means that when he scores his next goal, which is going to be very soon, probably uh, midweek or possibly yes. the week uh, at the weekend, yes. Sergio Aguero is going to be the highest scoring Manchester City player of all time. And what a, what a complete footballer he is, what a great player he is, yeah, but and what a fantastic but, thing to do. But why do you nominate him? You have no attachment to Manchester City or Aguero. You just popped him out the air, haven't you? Well, no, the yeah. idea of heroes and villains. Yeah. I don't have yeah. any attachment to the World Health Organization mm. either, yeah. but I've chosen them yeah. as villains. Okay. You don't seem to understand the way the system's right. meant to work. Okay. So you've got another hero, another villain to do, have you? Yeah, uh, I'll do another villain. Yeah, all right. Brian. Brian who? The, the, the Storm? The Storm. The Storm that Absolutely. you said. Uh, well, last week on yeah. Sky TV, yes. you said, mm. and I quote, mm. it's not going to amount to anything. Well, I meant, I meant, I meant no, in Ireland, you but said in it's this not, country no. it has been, it has, you know, caused well, people a lot of problems. Well, it killed people in Ireland and yeah. it caused 300,000 people to be without electricity. Well, there you go. There you go. You said nothing, so you so said Brian nothing has was, been a villain. No, but you said nothing was going to happen. I don't care what I said. In, You're in, the new in, Michael uh, Fish. No, no, ahead of uh, Brian hitting, but Brian hit, and as far as I'm concerned, villainous. Uh, the the storm. Oh, Brian, really? a villain, really? definitely. Yeah. Okay. Well, my villain uh, for um, this week is mm. going to have to be, I'm afraid, my final villain is going to have to mm. be, uh, as you call him, Mr. Cooman, mm. uh, because mm. Ronald Cooman has made a complete and utter dog's breakfast yeah. of whatever it was that he had done last season and whatever permission he was given to buy players yeah. with 150 million quid. He's no more close to the uh, mm. to the answer, as you said earlier, mm. Uh, mm. than he was a week ago. Right. In fact, if anything's further away, he has taken all this new money that's been injected by uh, your friend Mr. Mashiri mm. and completely wasted it. Mm. And, you know, rumours are circling that he's going to be out of a job in the morning. Mm. I wouldn't be at all surprised if you wake up and that is the case. Yeah. Um, so you've nominated two people in the football world, neither of whom you have any direct connection to. Nobody's Just supposed to have any. Out the air. Well, who would you like me to plucked nominate that I have a direct connection with? Right, OK. Hey? Now, my no, second... sorry, I'm just asking you sorry? a question. What? Do you not understand the rules of the game? Yes. The rules of the game are that I have to choose two heroes mm. and two villains. I don't yeah. have to have any connection to no, them. No, you just pluck them out of the air, though, you see. I, I, I prefer. Well, you have a connection to a storm called Brian, do you? I, I believe eh? that you should have some sort of Have you gone mad? Attachment. Now, my second hero... Pope Parry goes mad, should be my, my headline. My second right. hero is Bill Oddie. Bill Oddie? Yeah. He now, looks like you. Now, we interviewed Bill Oddie in person. We had we him not? in the studios in the here studio. not long ago. Absolutely. And, uh, he asked a, for a Mars bar, I think. He, he asked for a Mars bar. Mm. No, it was a Kit Kat, actually. Was it? A uh, Kit Kat. And uh, he's a great guy, and he had a, a book out. But the reason I'm nominating him is he's still going strong. And you nominate him as a villain, are you? No, as a hero. As oh, a, a hero. hero. As a hero. He's still going strong, 76 years of age, yeah. um, still presents Spring Watch. And he's not going to give up, even though... I thought he'd given that up. I thought one of the things he moaned about was the fact that he wasn't doing it anymore. No, no, no. uh, He's still doing it. He's he's still working, right? But the reason... It's not actually um, called uh, Springwatch anymore. So he's not doing Springwatch. No, he's still working. He's still working (laughs) and producing documentaries. And the reason why I'm nominating him as a hero is that he's doing all this despite the fact that Mm. he has just suffered another health problem... um, (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. Why are, you, why are you laughing? <laughs> because his new health problem is... He, he, he keeps hearing bagpipes in his left ear. Bagpipes? <laughs> bagpipes. That's a terrible affliction. Keeps hearing the sound of bagpipes in his yeah. left ear. What do you Which, keep hearing? Well, no, no. And I just think that it's great that, mm. you know, at 76 years of age, yeah. despite the fact that... You're hearing bagpipes in your left mm. ear all the time. Yeah. You're still going. Well, it can't be I good, I think it's that. brilliant. Yeah, I yeah. think that's possibly the worst heroes and villains you've ever <laughs> put together. I can't no. imagine that no. even with his bias towards <laughs> no. you and Everton, no. that no. Ross will give you the win on no, that No, one. no, no. But we'll find out coming up next. Well, you have nominated both, have you? I've yeah. done two, yeah. Have you? Okay, yeah, yeah I've right. done two heroes. Yeah. I've done two I mean, have you yeah. actually gone over the edge? <laughs> no, no. We are no. the two mics, Put and uh, we'll be back. This is 
talk sport we are of the two mics. Brian has tweeted in. He says, I never thought Porky would make me a villain. I haven't misbehaved that badly this week. Mm, well, there you go. You see, your name's mm. Brian. You're associated with the villainy. Yeah. Uh, John says, Aguero scoring on Saturday means he's already broken the record. He now has got 178 goals. So I was under the impression no, he, he scored. equaled it today. He's I equaled think. it. I thought, I thought he equaled, equaled it. it. Yeah. So John, I think you might not be right about that. But as a result, yeah. I can reveal uh, that Ross, even though he is an Everton fan and a co-conspirator of yours, has given me the victory, mm. which means it's five four to me. Yeah. Well, you see, I think he's just doing that to, um, you know, I think cover the inadequacies of uh, of your arguments, really. But he can't keep giving it to me every week. Uh, that's true. And mm. also, Blaze says, "Porky, you plank." His name is Idrissa Gay. Mm? The, the Everton player that got sent off. Uh, yeah, it's it's actually he's got three names. Has he? It is Idrissa Guiana Gay. Yeah, yeah. So you can use any one of those yes, combinations. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for pointing that out, Blaze. We've got the uh, back pages here as well. We have. Uh, yeah. Which we're going to have a look at, mm. and a lot of them have used the theme that we were talking about earlier on in the show. Mm, mm. Uh, specifically, the Mirror's got London Nine, Merseyside yeah, Three. I know. Which is not that great of a headline to me. No, I don't think it is either. I because... mean, it's the kind of thing that everybody said. Yes. At the time. Yes, but it doesn't make any sense to be honest, because well, it does. Because it's the number of goals scored. Yeah, I know. But, I mean, you know, you're talking about two distinctly separate football matches, and I don't know why they're piled together like that. Well, because sometimes people like you Mm. come out with things Mm. like Merseyside is going to be a very dominant place for Mm. the football world in this season. Yeah. And you said that back in sort of July. Because you were under the impression that both Liverpool and uh, Everton. I prefer were... actually the Telegraph, which has got two separate headlines: Mersey Misery, Kane double rocks Klopp, striker exposes Liverpool's desperate defending again, and then more Mersey Misery, Koeman on the brink after shocking defeat. That to me is far more, you know, well, it takes informative. A, it takes the story on, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. everybody knows what the score yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. Um, Kane double mm. rocks Klopp. Uh, on the Telegraph as well. Yeah. Uh, Koeman on the brink is on the eye as well after Arsenal thrash on the brink Everton. After Arsenal thrash Everton, plagued by calls for him to be sacked by home supporters inside Goodison Park. Ronald Koeman yesterday vowed to continue as Everton manager following the crushing 5-2. It's the first time I've seen supporters pouring out of Goodison Park, by the way. Well, I've never what, seen that. When that final never goal went that. in, yeah. um, I've never seen such an empty no. uh, a space behind the no, goal. Exactly. You know, and and people who were there were saying it was a very weird atmosphere that it wasn't even booing. Yeah, it I was know. just really kind of they but were all I, almost I, stunned. I think I think it was. I think it was a resignation of the fact that we've got serious problems and we're in serious trouble. Yeah, you know? I quite like this headline on the back of the t- of the Express. Yeah, Mersey, I do as well. Mersey beat. Yeah, oh, I, that's I, clever. I think that's clever as well because mm. Mersey beat, of course, was the title given to the music of the sixties. Uh, that came out of Liverpool, the Mersey beat. Yes. Koeman on the edge and Klopp on the defensive after heavy defeats and mm. links them together. I think yeah. that's uh, nicely done. It is nicely done. Yeah. It's not often we give the Express a, a, a sort of a big up, but yeah, so that's they right. might take it while it's there. Matt says, Porky yeah. is very interested in medieval times mm. because of the violence. Mm. But to be fair, he does live in Gosport. Uh, well, Crime say, Central. That, that's, that's what you've told people. It's not uh, true. Uh, on the back of the sun here, love stinks. That's L-O-V. Mm. Liverpool boss Jurgen Klopp slammed uh, Dejan Lovren, claiming he could have defended better than his Croatian centre-back. Uh, well, he made two mistakes, didn't he, for yeah. two of the goals? Hauled Lovren off in the 31st minute. That's a terrible humiliation, mm. Mike, you know, for a player to be taken off before half-time. Yeah. Um, particularly when you've gone two goals down. I mean, talk about pointing the finger. It's fairly obvious where the manager thought the blame lay. Yes. So the German hauled Lovren off in the 31st minute after he was badly at fault as Tottenham went 2-0 up in, uh, after 12 minutes. Mm. Lovren was caught napping for Harry Kane's opener, then missed a header as Kane set up number two for Hyung Min Son. I mean, I suppose you'd be able to say, which we haven't said yet, that yeah. the hoodoo that people talked about of uh, Spurs playing at Wembley is now officially over, right? I mean, we'd now presumably yeah. say yeah. that uh, that no longer exists because they've had a big win against Liverpool. And they've got uh, they won against Bournemouth. Yeah. They've won in the Champions League now mm. at Wembley. Mm. The only thing that I did see, and in fact, it was a guy from uh, Talk Sport um, who was uh, put the tweet out. He said the only problem still with, with going to Wembley, it was Anton who works here mm. uh, as, uh, as a producer, he said, the only problem still, it's half an hour after the game's finished and I'm still closer to the, to the stadium than I am to the station to yeah. try and get out of here. It, it, yeah. But there was, I think it was a record crowd, a record attendance that's, for the Premier League, right, wasn't that's it? That's right, yeah. So, it, so it, when it, you try to shift 80-odd thousand people... Yeah, in any any location, mm. it's going to be difficult. Yeah. Um, again, the Sunback page, written by Ken Lawrence, very experienced reporter, but uh, headline on it, um, Coe's losing him. Uh, Ron doubting stars backing. And and this takes the story on because what Ken says is Ronald Koeman is unsure if Everton's players are behind him as he clings to his job. The depressed Dutchman, I'd be depressed if I was him, yeah. watched Mesut Ozil uh, lead Arsenal's 5-2 destruction that plunged Tem on Everton into the Prem's bottom three and asked if the players still back him. He said, 
That's the feeling I have, but I don't know. Well, uh, that's a terrible he, position well, to be. Isn't that where he said that thing about having 25 um, yeah, people he, in the he, squad and you can't please everyone? He said, for every man you're working with 20, 29 players, you can't keep them all happy. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah, well, you can't. And then Metro mm. uh, has got um, uh, Mersey Slide as the headline. Cuban yeah, that's, clinging that's pretty on good. Uh, after mm. Arsenal romp piles the misery on Everton. So, yeah. I mean, it's very much a case that I suppose Cuman mm. is more um, in danger of losing his job than Klopp. Yeah. There's no suggestion that Klopp is. Yeah. Although he has admitted in the mail uh, that they may miss the top four. Yeah, angry Jurgen Klopp has played down Liverpool's top four chances this season and criticised the desire shown by his players in the formal defeat by Tottenham at Wembley. Liverpool manager, substitute defender, uh, Dejan Lovren, I've just said, well, and reacted strongly after the horror show. Yeah. Amazingly, the Mail have led on their back on Lewis on Brink. Hamilton roars yeah, in. I'm surprised but by that, aren't you? Away. Well, only that, what they push in the Daily Mail is their, their pull-out supplement called The Verdict. Yeah. Which is actually very good. I've, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of it. They've got yeah, new layouts. Yeah, this is a new 20-page uh, pull-out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. New layouts and new features and, uh, you know, new uh, sort of... Uh, new columns. New columns, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, Although they've lost Jamie Carragher, haven't they? He's gone to the Telegraph. Yeah, I found that a bit strange, mm. actually, because, uh, with all regard, the mail's sort of a bit more go-ahead, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, having said that, they the mail are a paper which don't always necessarily decide that football should be, you know, the uh, the best subject all the time. They're big on rugby, uh, big on motor racing because uh, Lewis on the brink. Mm. And, uh, you know, they, they're a bit more, um, what's the word I'm, I'm looking at, sort of global. Uh, I suppose so. On, and they might they might have football. taken a view that the latest yeah. sporting event in the night mm. was, in fact, this Formula yeah. One race in, in Austin, Texas, yeah. Rather, yeah, exactly, than, yeah. rather than the final whistle at Wembley. Yes, you know that's I mean? right, yeah. Uh, a couple here from uh, Paul. Paul says mm. this, can't wait to see these two legends in December. Great night ahead of us. Any tickets left by them, you won't mm. be disappointed. Yeah. There are actually t- some tickets left, but they are going very, very fast. So, yes, they uh, are, actually. But it's yeah. a big venue. It is. December the 17th. Yeah. Uh, Jim says, laughing insanely about Bill Oddie's imaginary bag pipes mm. pork is finally cracked yeah, well, it's completely may, deranged may, may, maybe i have but you know it's something i felt i had to bring and to a good attention. question from tom who says who's going to replace all of these managers that have got the sack or are on the brink shakespeare yeah. billich kuman and hughes that's a good question i mean we are looking at a possibility yeah. that in uh, sort of come december mm. there's gonna be a whole new tranche of managers it could well be mancini might be back yeah. pellegrini might be back it could well be you know um, listen, talking to our colleague, our historian colleague... Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca. Yes. Rebecca Ridley, was it? Uh, no, R- uh, Ridiel. Ridiel, yeah. Rebecca Ridiel. She went on about how they all fled to the Midlands and all that. Hey, uh, You know how the conspirators oh, yeah. all did fled they? to the Midlands. Yeah, they did, yeah. Did they? Yeah. I didn't hear that bit. Well, yeah, because she said a lot of it started in the Midlands. Now, when I worked on the Birmingham Evening Mail... a hotbed Mail, of Catholics in the Medieval yeah, yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Well, when I worked on the Birmingham Evening Mail, mm. I worked in, on in Redditch, yeah. and it was right on the Warwickshire-Worcestershire border. Oh, yeah. And on the road between a lovely little sort of village, really, called Studley, and a lovely little town called Studley. Ulster. Studley. Studley. Yeah. Studley, Ulster, and then on to um, Stratford-upon-Avon, yeah. Shakespeare Terrace, yes. obviously. It's Warwickshire, but, isn't it? On that, yeah, on that road from Studley to Ulster, there's a place called Coton Court. OK. It's a stately home, and it was where the gunpowder plot was... Pulled together. Oh, is that right? That's where. Oh, well, I wonder if they'll use that because they used yeah. a. I wonder if. Um, where, sorry, Catesby. Catesby. The, the well, that's where interesting you say that because when I watched the opening episode, mm. there appeared to be a kind of stately home. That's right. In the frame, that, and when you watch it, you can tell me if it's the same place because where they had they had mm. these uh, the the the, um, the the king's men coming to find the priest. That's right. Who has been hidden banging on the panels? Yeah, all bang, that. banging on the I panels. I think that yeah. was coat and court. Oh, okay. Well, uh, certainly it was Coat and Court. Whether they used the actual building or not, I don't know. But right. Coat and Court was where it was. Be, yeah. And the most interesting thing about that is that behind Coat and Court is a development of rather nice detached houses, uh-huh. right? Yes. One of which used to be occupied by a man with a yellow Ferrari. Oh, yeah. Otherwise known as Robbie Savage. Oh, Robbie Savage, yeah, OK. Yeah, when he played for Birmingham. Right. He lived there. OK. Yeah. He wasn't part of the conspiracy. He was not part of the conspiracy, no. that's for sure. Yeah, OK. Mm. So, um, why are you telling me this? Well, because it's so interesting that, you know, that's now on telly, that's the big show at the moment, uh-huh. and I know where the real location of where the gunpowder plot was right. hatched. OK. Coton Court, yes. near to uh-huh. Robbie Savage's house. Oh, OK. All right, well, well, I don't think he lives there anymore, I think he's moved.
fascinating to bring it all up to get up to date. Yeah, really. yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we're going to hear from you uh, next Thursday, of course. We're going to be here uh, at Talk Radio. We are. Uh, from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock Indeed. Thursday and 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock Friday. Indeed. Uh, we'll be back here on Talk Sport on Friday night as well. Yeah. Uh, have a good few days. We'll see you soon. Mm. Don't forget to follow the two mics at the two mics on Twitter and on YouTube. Just look for Two Mics TV.